Pythem Buset Jada. How did Kripke revive metaphysics? Well, it wasn't just Kripke. I don't think I don't think it was only Kripke who gets the blame for that one. Uh, you know, Quine and Putnam uh, probably had as um, just as much, if not more, important influence. Um, I think that the probably the most important in contribution that Kripke made to that is that Kripke uh, revived modality. Um, you know, he made he made modality respectable, um, both through you know, so he, he he sort of made talk of modality, talk of necessity, contingency, um, possibility as essences, right? He made this respectable, um, partly through developing uh, an alternative theory of reference and partly through uh, possible world semantics. Um, possible world semantics both laid, it, it kind of gave a foundation for modal logic. Um, and it's been a tool it's, that philosophers love to play with, you know. So um, we don't just use possible world semantics um, like as, as a semantics for modal logic. Um, we will actually use this notion of possible worlds to talk about, um, you know, metaphysical necessity, metaphysical possibility. Uh, th th I think the thought with metaphysics is, you know, look, the point of metaphysics is to understand the, like, fundamental nature of things. We're, and we're trying to understand not just the way that things are, but the way that things must be. Um, so, you know, you get talk of like necessity, possibility, essential properties. Kripke helped to bring all that back onto the table. Um, and do you think that metaphysics is in the end, is in the end of the day inescapable, no matter how we try to avoid it? Well, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe it is. Uh, it is not entirely clear where the line is between making claims about the world and doing metaphysics right like uh even what seems to be the most uh superficial uh, and easy claim about the world may well um carry with it a whole host of metaphysical presuppositions so i say for instance i have two hands what could be more obvious than that and what could be more you know what could be a more everyday claim than i have two hands but now, OK, let's let's think about this. I mean, so I have two hands. Well, what's the I? What, what is that? What is the self? Um, well, if we, OK, if we, when I say I have two hands, well, now we're talking about selves, minds, consciousness. Um, and that opens up a whole load of metaphysical problems. What are hands? I mean, when I say I have two hands. Um, there's there's like interest. So, so first of all, the notion of a hand. Well, OK, a hand is what well, it consists of a whole bunch of particles, you know, protons, neutrons, uh, electrons and so on. Um, but like, OK, why am I taking it that there's a hand instead of like, wh why suppose that there's a hand rather than just a bunch of particles arranged hand wise? When I say that I have two hands, I mean, um, well, wait a minute for each hand. I can kind of draw the boundaries around all of these particles in in a whole host of different ways. Like if you zoom right in, um, then, you know, you can imagine like drawing the boundaries around the particles so that, um, you know, they consist of a certain set of particles or you can draw the boundaries just slightly differently so that there's one particle that you're not including. Um, Obviously, the line between, you know, the hand and the arm is is vague. So, like, where exactly does that line go? Clearly, there's a, a million different places, a trillion different places that you could draw that line. So the point is, is that actually, you know, you could say that there's not just two hands here. I mean, you could say there's 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 <laughs> trillions and trillions of hands um, that are all overlapping, right? Like by drawing the lines in slightly different places. So there are problems of you know, the, the notion of material objects um, that, that are raised by that question. When I say I have two hands, then I'm like, there's there's some weird kind of relation of, of having. Like, what is it for uh, the hands to be part of me or for like a mind to have, the, for a mind to be connected to matter? What the hell's going on there? Um, I have two hands. Two. Two hands? Two? Well, does that involve a commitment to numbers, to the number two? What the hell is the notion of the number two? Okay, so basically, look, even in saying something like I have two hands, maybe I'm, you know, getting involved in metaphysics. Um, I don't, like, yeah, maybe. That seems, that seems plausible enough. Um, I think that what I would want to resist, uh, 
as somebody who is on the more empiricist side of these debates, is, uh, is, is a sort of explanation by postulation. So I want to say that, look, there's all sorts of various um, discourses about uh, discourses that we engage in, um, you know, about the world and about other things. And, um, you know, so we, we talk about objects, we talk about morality, about mathematics, um, you know, we do science, etc. And, you know, there is a tendency to try to explain these discourses by postulating entities beyond experience um, of which those discourses provide true descriptions. Um, as an empiricist, I want, I want no part of that. Um, but maybe it is inescapable. I mean, I'm trying to escape it. I'm trying to escape it, but maybe it is inescapable. Uh, all I can do is just make a commitment to the project and see what happens. Um, Helvetica Neptune. Um, uh, what is your take on professional sports and the reason why people spend their lives following millionaires who don't give a shit about them? Well, look, people following millionaires who don't give a shit about them is... That's not just a thing that happens in professional sports. That just happens wherever there's any kind of famous person. Um, and look, I, I mean, I think that sports is just self-evidently the most boring thing in the world. Um, uh, I, I feel like anybody who's interested in sports on any level must just have, like, fundamentally a different brain to me. I mean, like, there is just something... Like, I mean, almost... To me, you know, it's like almost pathological. Like there's almost, it's almost like there's something wrong with you. Uh, not really. I'm, I, I don't, uh, I don't really think that. But, but no, seriously, like you are just your like whole kind of values, like your aesthetic values, um, the things that you care about must just be fundamentally pointing in a completely different direction. Because I think it is, like, I think it is the most boring thing in the world. I am not kidding when I say I would rather watch. I, I actually r really rather would watch paint dry than watch, like, I don't know, a bunch of guys kicking a ball around the field. I, I would rather watch paint dry. Um, I'm not joking about that. I'm, I'm actually kind of interested in, like, uh, you know, experimental art and stuff. And uh, so, you know, watching paint dry might not be so bad. Um, so, but look, I mean, if you have anything that people are interested in, then people are going to spend lots of money on it. I just said I'm interested in experimental art. I mean, have you seen the sort of money people spend on, you know, splashes of paint on a canvas? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, every field has this thing. The people at the top gain enormous amounts of wealth. And um, that's just seem, that just seems to be the way it works. Uh, I don't... Uh, I, I don't really know why that is. Um, but I don't think it's something that just happens in sports. Um, it's also not really, to me... A problem. I'm not concerned really about inequality just in itself. Um, where the, so the reason why things like this are a problem is because there's like loads of people who are in poverty, um, and it's kind of appalling, right? It's kind of appalling when you sort of see uh, millions of pounds being uh, hoarded by people running around fields, uh, and then you know you see people who can't afford, you, you see you know, millions of people who can't afford food or, uh, uh, you know, you, you see like, uh, you know, millions of pounds being spent on uh, splashes of paint on a canvas. And yeah, I mean, it just, that doesn't feel right. But uh, the, the issue there, as far as I'm concerned, is not the inequality in itself. The issue is um, the the poverty, right? Like if we, if we could get everybody to a standard of living where, you know, everybody had access to good food, clean water, good shelter, health care, uh, everybody had enough money to indulge in certain luxuries, then I would not be remotely bothered by the fact that, um, you know, some people have uh, just obscene amounts of wealth. It's just, I wouldn't care. Um, what is your opinion on Avicenna Av Averos? I don't know. I don't have uh, any idea. I don't think I've ever read anything by them. Finally, as a pessimist, what is your opinion on Schopenhauer and the pandeistic philosophy of Mainlander? Well, I've never read Mainlander. I've also actually never read Schopenhauer. Um, I have been told that my views are similar to Schopenhauer's, um, but that's really all I can say about it. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, look, the thing is with the pessimism stuff is that it's not something I'm actually, like, deeply interested in. Uh, I 
reflect when I reflect on my life, I think, oh, my life sucks. And I'm like, okay, yeah, life is my life is terrible. Um, you know, and then that kind of thing leads me to pessimistic conclusions, right? But I don't really bother reflecting on my life very often. I mean, it's not something I I really engage in very much. Um, it's not a philosophical topic that uh, engages me very deeply. Um, so I, I don't, like, I, I wouldn't say that, I, I don't really know if I should even identify myself as a pessimist. Like, it's not, like, I don't know if I can say that, you know, pessimism is a philosophical stance that I hold in the way that something like empiricism is a stance I hold. I mean, I've, I've like, read a lot about empiricism and I care a lot about empiricism and I think about it a lot. Um, but pessimism, I, like, you know, okay, occasionally, you know, it's uh, sort of interesting to sit down and, reflect on things, but it, it doesn't, um, doesn't really grab me. Um, okay, Holderman, what do you think was the best decade for music? I don't know, it's, um, it's a tricky one, I suppose. You know, my favourite genres are, uh, are free jazz and uh, experimental modern classical and, uh, and, and sort of 80s pop. I really love the... Sa I, so, I think that for free jazz and experimental classical, you probably want to be coming down on well, you know, maybe 70s or 80s, probably the best for them. Um, I, I don't know. I think, yeah, for free jazz, I, I feel like maybe the kind of late 60s to 70s might have been the best era. Um, but there's loads of great free free jazz being produced. I mean, even even now. Um, uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm actually sort of leaning towards saying the 80s um, because, as I said, I, I really love the sound of 80s music, the production sound of 80s music. I love the synthesizers and the gated reverb and uh, uh, just the, the sort of slickness. And there's a certain, a lot of 80s music, just in the way that it's produced, just in the production sound, it feels almost sort of desolate to me. <laughs> there's a kind of desolate feeling to it. Um, so I, I like, I, I'm attracted to like the 80s, 80s sound or certain aspects of the 80s sound um when it comes to kind of more like pop rock stuff um and then as i say free jazz experimental classical well there was plenty of great stuff being produced in the 1980s um when i think about my favorite artists um you know john cage uh frank zappa derek bailey uh sun ra i mean they were all they were all great in the 80s um so maybe the 80s um hugo b do you think moral anti-realism needs better theories to explain moral language um mm, well maybe i mean maybe in general meta-ethicists need better theories for moral language but i don't think the issue is really uh, a problem for anti-realists specifically uh so generally i think anti-realists can probably appeal to the same theories as realists. I mean, um, we can separate the questions of the semantics of moral terms or the pragmatics of moral terms. We can separate those questions about moral language and the meaning of moral judgments from the line that we then take, you know, about uh, 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 the kind of metaphysics and epistemology of moral uh, values. I mean, so if you uh, like, like, for instance, I mean, uh, error theory, right, has the same semantics as non-naturalist realism. Uh, but the error theory differs in terms of the metaphysics. So moral anti-realists can very often appeal to the same um, theories of language as realists do. Now, there are exceptions to this. Um, uh, there are exceptions to this. Uh, so moral naturalism, for example... Um, well, if you endorse a, a moral naturalist account of the semantics of moral terms, then that may not be incompatible with that may not be compatible with anti-realism. Although I actually tend to think that um, at least some apparently realist theories might end up committed to a kind of anti-realism anyway, because what what a lot of moral naturalist theories try to do is they try to identify the uh, they'll, they'll try to say that, you know, well, the, the moral terms are picking out natural properties. Um, now, w the reason why that might end up with a kind of moral anti-realism is if the natural properties in question uh, also don't exist. So, um, 
I mean, a good example of this, I mean, this isn't really moral naturalism, but it's just an example, uh, is something like divine command theory. So suppose that somebody tells you that, um, you know, so the statement that X is morally right, uh, that just means X is commanded by God. Okay, um, but now suppose there is no God. So nothing is commanded by God. Well, in that case, um, uh, like it, it's like you've tried to give a, a realist theory. You've tried to give a theory on which moral terms refer, but actually they just don't, right? <laughs> like, so you've said you've identified moral goodness with being commanded by God. Um, but hey, maybe there's no God, in which case nothing is commanded by God, and so there is no moral goodness. Uh, so you know, uh, I think that um, I think that that problem is something that is going to potentially arise for a lot of the more popular naturalist. Uh, proposals as well. Um, I, Richard Joyce talks about this in the article The Accidental Error Theorist. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I guess the, the point is just <clears throat> generally, in, in many cases, anti-realists can appeal to the same semantics and pragmatics of moral language that realists do. Um, even in cases where an, an anti-realist might not be so keen on doing that, uh, well, it might be the case that a supposedly realist semantics actually ends up with anti-realism anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the answer is, I don't think anti-realism is worse off than realism with respect to moral language. Um, are you going to make videos on free will? Uh, I don't have any plans to that. Uh, I am not a heretic asks, what do you think of skeptical theism? I think that, uh, I mean, it seems to be basically just a more sophisticated version of the, uh, of, of saying that, you know, God works in mysterious ways, and, I mean, that has always struck me, and I think it strikes most other people as a deeply unsatisfying response. Um, uh, I, I, I don't really think that for all of its technical sophistication, I, I'm not really sure that Skeptical theism has ever managed to overcome that sort of deep sense of dissatisfaction at the heart of what it is proposing. Um, inventive harvest. Why is it necessary that the belief be true to be considered knowledge? Isn't strong justification good enough to be fairly certain of a belief? It seems to me that the requirement that a belief be true puts an impossible burden on knowledge. Well, I mean, strong, ju strong enough justification is presumably good enough to be fairly certain, um, but I, I mean, that's like, a, a, so you can be fairly certain of a belief that's false. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, it just seems like, yeah, we wouldn't say that something is, um, like, can you, can you know a false proposition? That seems, uh, I, I just don't, I, that seems very strange, right? Like, uh, so I'm I'm not I'm not sure what to say beyond that. Um, I don't know. Um, I want I want to say more about this, but the the truth is I just I don't see any motivation for uh, abandoning the truth condition in the analysis of knowledge. Uh, it just seems like yeah, you can't, if you, if if I know something, if I know a proposition, then I'm going to take it that that proposition is true. I mean, like I might use the word knowledge in. Um, like I can use it kind of uh, as as a tool of emphasis, right? Um, like I might say, for instance, uh, I don't know. Uh, after the uh, after the after an election, I I might I might look at the uh, twenty twenty election and I I might say, oh, I I knew that Donald Trump was going to win, um, even though he didn't win, right? So like that's a context where I might say that I knew something, um, or but then the proposition was false. But I I wouldn't. I mean, I would just take that as like uh, a kind of hyperbolic, right? I, I don't know if a statement like that is really telling us anything substantive about, you know, what knowledge really is. Um, so, yeah, I think, the I mean, like, what, what would be the most... I just don't see the motivation for, for dropping the truth condition. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite happy to say that a uh, belief has to be true to be known. Um, Jacques Rossier asks... Are you happy? Um, uh, no, not not really. I don't think so. Um, 
not not in general. I think occasionally I'm 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 happy, but I would say that happiness is um, you know it's unfortunately something that occurs very infrequently and uh, you know when it lasts it doesn't last long and when it happens it's not as intense as you would like i unfortunately my sort of you know my my general kind of perspective is maybe on the more pessimistic side um uh so you know but i'm not really that bothered about the fact that i'm not happy i mean uh, i i gen the way that i tend to approach life is that i have various things happening, various problems, and I, I, I just get on with them. You know, there's things that take my interest, right? And I just get on with them. Like this, for instance, this is something, like doing this right now um, isn't exactly making me happy. I mean, it's just something I'm doing. It's like I've set myself this goal of answering all of your questions, and I'm just doing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really, I don't know, I, maybe it makes me happy, maybe it does, maybe I just don't have a very good access to my own uh, emotional state. Um, I wouldn't say I'm sad, but uh, I, I would say that at the moment I'm I'm sort of broadly neutral. Um, Jake Paul, would you ever do an OnlyFans? I've already been asked this question, um, so I will uh, link you to the person who asked it when I put the video up. Um, Jobin Biju, how do you evaluate Michael Humer's defense of moral realism? Well, Michael Humer has a number of arguments, um, so it would take a little while to go through the whole the whole lot of them. Uh, I think, I mean, I can say I think that his arguments are very weak. Now, the, I, I guess if we're talking about Michael Humer's defense of moral realism, I would um, assume you're probably, I mean, the central plank of his defense is phenomenal conservatism. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, rational in the absence of defeaters to believe that things are the way they seem to be. It is rational to believe our intuitions. Um, so I got a, a couple of problems with that. Uh, the first problem is that I don't accept that there is, in fact, any intuition in favour of realism. Um, so, first of all, I mean, just speaking for myself, I do not find realism even remotely intuitive. Um, now, it's true that I have I guess you could say, so I guess I would say that I have the intuition that, for instance, slavery is wrong. Um, like, so if you say slavery is wrong, then I am indeed inclined to say yes, right? <laughs> yes, slavery is wrong. You know, I, I, like, I react negatively to slavery. But I don't think that's really an intuition in favour of, re like, that's not a realist intuition, because, um, I mean, there are a whole bunch of like anti-realist approaches to moral uh, moral judgment, um, which on which you can just straightforwardly endorse that judgment. So relativists, subjectivists, constructivists, quasi-realists, um, they will they can all say that slavery is wrong. In fact, they can say that it's true that slavery is wrong. Um, you know, truth is like even even from a moral anti-realist point of view, you can have moral truth. Um, so uh, like, okay. I, I have the intuition that slavery is wrong. Uh, maybe I even have the intuition that it is true that slavery is wrong. Um, I don't think I do have that intuition, actually. But I, at least I do have the intuition that slavery is wrong. Um, but that's not an intuition that lends any support to realism. What you would need in order to lend support to realism is the intuition that it is a stance-independent fact that slavery is wrong. Um, and I don't have that intuition. I'm also extremely skeptical that, you know, the, 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 the layman on the street has that intuition, let's say. I, in fact, I think that there is um, fairly convincing empirical evidence that, um, that ordinary people uh, have, uh, not like universally, but uh, that there are many ordinary people who have quite strongly anti-realist inclinations. Um, uh, the, the so you know I, uh, this attitude that some realists seem to have that you know realism is just the common sense position that intuitions favour realism. I think that the empirical evidence at this point um, seems to be pointing against that. Um, so uh, I mean, if anything, from the point of view of phenomenal conservatism, I actually have prima facie evidence against realism. Uh, the second thing is that. Um, even if I did have this intuition in favour of realism, well, you know, I think that there are actually defeaters. Uh, so for Humer's brand of realism, I, um, 
you know there are the the epistemological challenges um so you know like the the, the like how we could have access to the non-natural facts i think there's you know uh problems of explanatory impotence there's the first order inconsistency argument there is the problems with um, assigning any meaning to the notion of categorical normativity um you know uh, so the sort of the sort of problems that i've uh, i've i've talked about in in previous videos um that i've made on on this topic you know i so yeah i just don't find it convincing um but obviously that's only one part of Hume's defense of moral realism. I know he has many other arguments. Um, uh, I, I, again, I would just say I, I don't find his arguments very strong. Um, John Sebastian, in the Platonic dialogue, Freydus, uh, Socrates explains how the written word cannot answer back or defend itself and hence is it inferior to the spoken word. Where does that leave philosophy today where the primary medium is the written format? Well, I mean, if, like, what? <laughs> I can write something uh, then somebody can say or write something back to me, and then I can write something in defence. So, like, I don't see any difference between the written word and the spoken word here. Like, we can talk in a dialogue. I can say stuff. You can speak stuff. Uh, I can say stuff back. Um, or we can write in a dialogue. Uh, what, like, what's the difference? Um, okay, uh, Jonathan Van Slydregd, um I have a question regarding your video on the first order argument for moral error theory. It has been suggested that the implication of Cowie's first order argument for error theory is the unpopular moral abolitionist response to the now what question. Do you think abolitionism is the only option left for the first order moral error theorist? I, I would be curious who has suggested this. That seems totally unmotivated to me. Uh, I, I, like, wh like, why would that be the case? Um, um there is the, like what's wrong with for instance having an inconsistent fiction okay so like one option for a moral error theorist is fictionalism we can treat our uh our, our, our uh, moral judgments as um as in containing a some sort of you know either a, they can be like a pretense or they can contain a, a fiction operator or whatever um so we can treat morality as a useful fiction um now, Cowie's argument for error theory is that morality has a first order incoherence, so it's inconsistent. Uh, how is that a problem for fictionalism? Like, there can be inconsistent fictions. You know, I can, I can write a fiction and then it can contain a contradiction and that's fine because it's fiction, right? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you, like, if you have a contradiction in fiction, the contradiction is not in itself a problem. I mean, um, like, it, I mean, it can be a problem. So I can see why, like, look, if, if morality is inconsistent, then this might be a problem because one of the things that we want from morality is we want it to be action guiding. And, you know, if it's inconsistent, then it may be the case that there are uh, certain circumstances where it tells us both to do A and to do not A. And, um, you know, that's not really going to be much use for helping us to guide our actions. But, you know, as long as, um, as long as those circumstances are, you know, limited to uh, sort of unusual cases or, uh, or, or to purely hypothetical scenarios, um, it doesn't seem like there's really going to be any problem, right? Like, so as, as long as our fictional morality, which contains inconsistencies, as long as we can kind of, um, you know, quarantine those inconsistencies uh, to, uh, 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 to, to, to contexts like that are, you know, we don't have to deal with in our everyday interactions, then it might not be a problem. In fact, even if we can't quarantine those inconsistencies, it's not clear that it would necessarily be uh, a problem because I might just, you know, like I, I can just uh, choose to favour, you know, one uh, type, one as one part of the morality or something like that. Um, so, but yeah, the, the the main point though is just there's clearly nothing problematic about having an inconsistent fiction. Fictions can be inconsistent. So the mere fact that morality is inconsistent would not in itself be any problem for a fictionalist analysis. Um, and fictionalism is uh, one of the more popular responses. So. Um, 
I don't know. I just don't see why you, you'd have to be a moral abolitionist. Um, the assumption seems to be that we like, we have to just eradicate all contradiction. But like, I don't know, why would we want to do that? Uh, contradictions can be pretty damn cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't, I don't know what the motivation is for that. Uh, Junatan Nogisto, what is your opinion on the literature on metaphysical grounding? Well, you know what? I haven't really paid much attention to that literature. I don't, I don't think I believe in fundamentality. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, uh, I'm afraid I don't really have anything to say about this. It's, um, it's not really something I know anything about. Um, <clears throat> Do, do, do justice do you see any hope for justification or do you think true belief is all we get i mean look i've i don't think there is justification i i think that skeptical the skeptical arguments are successful um i, I don't know like can I, I i i mean i wouldn't sort of rule out the possibility that i will encounter um a, a skeptical a response to these skeptical arguments in the future which gives me greater confidence in justification uh yeah i mean i, I don't know i can't rule that out maybe that'll happen but i you know like right now my stance is um there's a whole bunch of extremely powerful skeptical arguments which seem to me to just undermine justification uh they successfully undermine justification so i think uh you know if you're, if you're gonna hold beliefs um then you're gonna have to figure out <laughs> you know, some, some sort of alternative account of like, you know, what, what makes it you know reasonable to hold beliefs or like what it is to hold rational beliefs, um, beyond saying that they, that you have justification for them. Uh, Kenneth Goetz, what are your thoughts on decisionism in political and moral ethical theory and as a possible solution to the problem of the criterion? It is very similar to dogmaticism and supremacism. I have to, I, t I have to tell you, I don't know what decisionism is, um, I looked it up very briefly before doing this, and uh, it's, it actually sounded like it was more like fictionalism, because it, it sounded like decisionists are just explicitly, like, grounding the, uh, you know, the laws and so on, on decisions, right? Um, but it, I, I, yeah, so it, it, seemed, it seemed more in line with, like, the fictionalist or, or voluntarist um, move. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know decisionism, so I can't really comment. Um, I mean, look, my kind of line on this, broadly speaking, is I think that the dogmatist slash supremacist is basically doing exactly the same thing as the uh, as the fictionalist. Um, the only difference is, is the dogmatist is banging her fist on the table very hard. Um, look, you're, I think the options are you either just give up all belief or you make shit up um that's it and you can be honest about making shit up or you can make shit up while banging your fist on the table and insisting that your shit is the real shit um but i mean i don't know the difference there just seems to be pure aesthetics so uh <laughs> um but no i look i don't i don't really i, I can't really answer the question because i don't know what uh, decisionism is uh Crichton sp asks Top five favourite films of all time. Um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, Della Morte, Della More, uh, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1973, um, Peter Weir, Last Wave, uh, so the, I think that was 1974, The Last Wave. Um, what else do I really like? Uh, Wallace and Gromit, The Wrong Trousers, um, The Terminator, um, yeah, there's lots of films I like. I think I've listed more than five there. Um, uh, Lani, Lani, Lani Akia Local. Uh, is there a philosophy dictionary where I can search the concepts that can't be searched in a normal dictionary? When I read philosophy books, I can't understand some concepts that the book assumes I understand. Um, I don't... I, I don't know. I think they do sometimes do sort of philosophy dictionary type things, but they're usually kind of sp for specific... Uh, for specific uh, topics, I'm, I'm actually I don't know. Yeah, I can't really help you. Sorry. Uh, you know, when when I get sort of stuck on you know reading something and there's something I don't understand, I usually I usually look it up at, on the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy first, 
Um, and then I look it up on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. But that's not a dictionary. Um, I think the problem with a dictionary is that you're not really... So when you're like reading a book and you come across concepts you can't understand, I'm not sure that it would necessarily be helpful to just have like a dictionary definition. Usually you need an explanation of the like theory in which that concept appears. Um, and, and maybe even an explanation of like some of the arguments that have invoked that concept. I uh, be like it's. I, I don't know if just like having a simple like you know two line definition. You know, well, this is what you know. Th this is what this means. You know, this is what intentionality is. Um, would be that much help. Um, so, but yeah, sorry, I, I sorry, I can't really help. Um, Lev Zverkot, do you feel intuitively that there is nothing in any sense? Can we think about it? And if we can, does it mean that it is an object with some type of being? I think it's a bit strange to think of nothing as an object. It seems like we're sort of, you know, you know reifying nothingness. Um, I would think of nothing as, like, nothing is the absence of an object. That's the, you know, it's, nothing is absence. That's the, the more uh, standard way to think about it. I mean, suppose, like, I destroy my computer, okay? Well, would I then say that there's, like, an object occupying the space where the computer used to be? Um, I mean, I guess there are, there actually would be objects because there's, you know, the air and stuff like that. But, you know, so, so ignoring that, right, let's take... Let's take the computer, destroy the computer. Well, is there then, like, is it replaced by, you know, an object, like a non-computer? So when I destroy the computer, is it replaced by a non-computer that occupies the same space? Well, I don't know, maybe, right? Maybe it actually is. But that's a very strange way of speaking. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with strange ways of speaking. Um, I, I actually think there's nothing wrong with, you know, proposing alternative object frameworks. Um, I think that the thing is, is that this does, it, it sort of raises puzzles, right, if we start thinking of nothing as as an object. Um, the trouble with the nothing object is that in addition to the non-computer, there would also be the uh, the non-tractor and the non-Donald Trump and uh, 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 the the, the non-rat uh, king <laughs> uh, occupying the same location at the same time. Um, I, I don't know, it doesn't seem like a particularly useful way of, um, of, of sort of thinking about things. Um, so, you know, I, I, to me, it's, it's just a kind of pragmatic matter how we choose to sort of divide up the objects in the world. And I, I don't know if it's particularly useful to think of like nothing uh, as an object, but, I, I, you know, maybe it is. Um, if you met your perfect clone, who would look and think identically and have the same memories as yours, would it be moral to kill him or keep him locked up in the attic, given that if such an idea came to you, then it certainly came to him too? I mean, the idea would come to him, but then he would immediately dismiss it. Um, like, in the same way that, like, that ha that happens with other people. I mean, not just clones, right? Like, you can be walking around the street and the idea the idea can come to you of killing right like the thought of killing can come into your head but then you just dismiss it because like why would you go around killing people um i mean i guess not everybody dismisses it but it's pretty rare that anybody acts on that at least on on the, on the normal everyday course of things um i like i mean the i don't go around like locking up strangers preemptively uh you know um, I'm certainly not going to lock up my clone preemptively. I know that I'm not violent. I know my clone wouldn't be violent to me. My clone would absolutely have the thought of killing me because, you know, I mean, uh, and indulging in dark fantasies is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun for me, so it's going to be a lot of fun for my clone, right? Um, but, yeah, I mean, they're just fantasies. We're not, I'm not actually going to go around killing people. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to kill my clone. Uh, my clone is cool. Uh, so, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm very... Uh, I'm very peaceful, and uh, I think I would get on very, very well with my clone. <clears throat> uh, Lily, have you ever considered starting an OnlyFans? Another OnlyFans question. I have asked, answered that question earlier, so if you look at the list of question responses, um, it's somewhere in there. Uh, Log, what is your least favourite area topic in philosophy? I mean, there are areas that I just don't really have that much interest in, like, I don't know... Uh, 
scholastic metaphysics, uh, most ancient philosophy, um, continental philosophy. In fact, like most of philosophy, I'm just not really that interested in, you know. Um, uh, I was educated in the in, in the sort of analytic tradition, broadly speaking, and that's where most of my interests lie. Uh, what is your favourite area slash topic in philosophy? Well, um, the, uh, you know, philosophy of science, I think, is the is the is the kind of area that I um, that I know best and uh, the and, and also meta ethics. Um, and then for a specific topic, um, the realism anti realism debate in philosophy of science. That's what I did my degree on. It's what I did my uh, my degree dissertation. It's what I did my uh, MA dissertation on. And it's what I did my PhD on. <clears throat> Lonely stranger, do you think too much philosophy can drive someone crazy? Um, uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think philosophy has, you know, it's just, it's just a thing. It's just a topic you can engage in and uh, think about. You know, uh, I, I don't, I don't think it has that sort of influence on people's minds. Um, Louis, Louis Poynton, um, what are your thoughts on republicanism in the UK and Commonwealth? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hate the monarchy. I would like to see it totally abolished. Uh, I mean, I, I just sort of hate states and authority in general. I hate anybody who claims to be a leader, but I suppose I, I do have a special kind of hatred for the monarchy in particular. Um, I think that any sort of royal, like royals are just a bunch of scumbags. And, uh, you know, I, yeah. Uh, so tear them all down. Um, I don't have... A sophisticated response to this right I'm just I just just hate one I hate royals that's it um, Liskos I'm trying to write a dissertation about postmodern elements in philosophy and mathematics could you give me any pointers or a direction uh, John Wood's paradox and para consistency um, <laughs> maybe I don't know that might not be actually postmodern I think it kind I mean he he talks about uh, what he calls postmodern logic, um, but uh, I think that, that that's yeah. So maybe, um, but it's not postmodernism in you know in the usual way. Uh, but that will perhaps give you a perspective on postmodernism that you wouldn't get from just the sort of um, yeah. From it's it's not the usual perspective. Uh, on postmodernism, let's put it that way. Um, uh, somebody with a name I can't possibly pronounce. Um, I have two questions. How did you buy all those books, given their high price? Uh, well, that question contains a false presupposition. They did not have a high price. Uh, all the books that I buy, um, I only buy stuff if I can get it very, very cheap. And for a lot of those books, uh, you just get them secondhand. You know, go on Amazon, you look up, you, you can find second-hand versions and uh, you get them pretty cheap. Um, how is philosophy related to science and humanities? Well, I tend to think of philosophy as continuous with both of these areas. I think there's a great deal of, of overlap. I think the, the difference is just going to be things like philosophy is focused on more um, conceptual issues. You know, philosophy engages more with like thought experiments. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's like it's focused on concepts it's focused on you, you know engaging in things like thought experiments um and i think also philosophy is sort of less maybe a bit less beholden to kind of pra like practical results you know philosophers aren't really concerned with going out and performing experiments or with uh, uh building technologies or anything like that um but i don't see there being a you know a, a, any kind of really radical distinction between like philosophy and science and humanities i actually think that the um the way that we have sort of organized these areas of inquiry is really something of an accident uh, you, you know i mean the, the concept like science uh really only came into common use in the 1800s um so the divisions that we have between these different areas um are i think yeah i mean a little bit kind of accidental yeah um okay uh mark what do you think of a form of normative realism whereby there are normative truths but no normative facts or properties in the world? The truths are non-synthetic, 
not made true or not true in virtue of entities in the world, just like how water equals H2O and bachelors are unmarried are both non-synthetic truths and also non-mysterious, since the second is true in virtue of meaning, while the first is true in virtue of identifying co-referring names, not in virtue of any substantial fact in the world. Might moral normative truths be true in the same way? Um, well, I think there's a lot here that I just don't I'm, I'm not going to get on board with. Um, so, so I should say, first of all, I, I uh, you know, the, um, this idea of there being things that are true in virtue of identifying co-referring names, um, I'm, I'm broadly sceptical of this. Uh, um, so the examples that are often given of this, I don't think actually work. I mean, so water equals H2O. I don't think that's even true. Um, so it's, <laughs> I mean... Uh, you know, we, uh, I mean, we don't have to get into any question of uh, what kind of truth it is. It, it isn't true. So uh, at least it's not true on uh, if we're taking, you know, H2O to be um, a, a specification of a particular, uh, you know, microstructure, uh, like a molecular structure. Uh, and I have a video called Water is Not H2O where I um, defend that claim. Um, but look, even if I were to accept the identification of uh, water with H2O, uh, I actually would take that as a synthetic truth, as just a straightforward empirical discovery. Uh, now, obviously, I, I mean, the, the the sort of standard argument against this is like twin Earth type cases. Um, all I can say is that, I mean, look, my intuition in the twin Earth case is that uh, I think that it's just indeterminate whether or not water is X, Y, Z. Actually, honestly, my intuition is that Water just is X, Y, Z. Uh, I think, I think uh, um, we would just say, OK, we've discovered that there are other structures that constitute water. Um, and part of the reason why I have that intuition is because I think there are already other structures that constitute water. Water can already, like, it's already the case. We know, in fact, that water can be constituted by things other than H2O. Um, so uh, the idea that water can be constituted by X, Y, Z is perfectly fine. Um, but like e even putting that aside, you know, even if it were the case that all water is just H2O and then, you know, there's this twin earth where there's a water like substance constituted by X, Y, Z. Um, I would take it to be just indeterminate whether water is X, Y, Z. And, you know, we would have to just negotiate on whether or not we want to use the term that way. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that. It, so, I, I mean, yeah, like there's this. this I just don't accept this kind of Kripke Putnam approach to meaning. Um, also, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not entirely sure about this, but it kind of sounds like you're proposing uh, some sort of moral naturalism here. So, you know, the analogy is to water equals H2O. So I guess goodness equals something else, right? Well, I mean, the key is how you're going to fill in that identification. And uh, like the, there are there are proposals for doing that, but like when I look at those proposals, I often have objections. Um, so like you know, I have engaged with uh, with other for, with forms of moral naturalism, and I have objections to the identifications. In some of the cases, um, the supposed natural properties that are being picked out, I I don't think exist. Um, so. Uh, it would be as if you claim that water is H2O, um, but then it just turns out that there's actually no such thing as H2O, right? Like, so there are forms of naturalism which identify goodness with a purported natural property, but actually I, I'm not sure that that there even is such a natural property. Um, or it's maybe, you know, we can't identify the natural property in the way that the theory says. Um, uh, but the general worry I have with moral naturalism is I think it... it fails to capture normativity. Um, moral properties are supposed to be properties that have a special kind of authority over us. They provide, you know, reasons for action and reasons for action that are independent of our own personal desires and, and goals, you know, like even if I want to uh, own slaves and even if owning slaves would satisfy all of my own personal goals, um, still I ought not to own slaves. It's morally wrong. Um, so, I, I think that the, the problem is that I... So, yeah, I mean, one, like, general issue I tend to have with moral naturalism is that I just don't think that it captures... Um, it captures normativity. Um, 
uh, yeah, and so I, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to like give specific comments on this because you know, um, you have like I don't know. I don't know what sort of identification you favour, but I can say that it seems like the general approach that you're taking to meaning is not one that I would accept, and I have general issues with moral naturalism. Um, let me, let me, I'll put it that way. Uh, Mark Koikendell, I really enjoyed your series on philosophy of sex. I want more of that. Uh, but I uh, don't expect you to post another series just because I asked for it. Uh, I'm summarising here. Uh, <laughs> do, do, could you point me towards another person who's done a nice overview? I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't. I don't, I don't know. It's been too long since I've... Um, I don't know if uh, there's any more philosophy of sex on YouTube. And as for like you know, literature on philosophy of sex. It's just been too long since I've engaged with it. I actually just don't remember. Um, Mele Osbel, Osbal, what is the best argument that we are not brains in a vat? Um, I think the best, I think the best argument um, is this, you know, the brain in the vat hypothesis is a very specific metaphysical hypothesis. Um, it's it's one hypothesis among I mean millions right like there's there's, there's there's so many alternative hypotheses to the to the brain in the vat I mean there's so there's the brain in the vat hypothesis um, and then there's the uh, there's the matrix hypothesis for instance that's kind of similar right like where instead of it just being one brain in the vat you've basically got loads and loads of brains in vats and those brains in vats are like communicating within the matrix. Um, and then you've got the uh, the evil demon hypothesis where there's just me being deceived by an evil demon. And then you've got the external world hypothesis where my experiences are being produced by external objects. And then you've got the, you know, Barclian idealist hypothesis. And then uh, you've got the uh, Boltzmann brain hypothesis. I mean, so there's you know, the, you're, it's just, you know, the number of hypotheses is the limits of your imagination, right? Um, so the brain in the vat is just one among many, 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 many hypotheses. And so we should, I mean, we should just take it. Uh, I mean, it, it seems at least reasonable to take it just a priori uh, to be improbable. Um, you know, it's... Uh, just, just one among uh, a, a countless number. There are countless alternatives to the brain in the bat, and there's no particular reason to to favour the brain in the bat hypothesis, um, or or at least you know uh, until we have been given a particular reason to favour the brain in the bat hypothesis, we should um, you know we shouldn't take it to be significantly more likely than any of these other hypotheses, right? So I guess yeah, that's the sort of uh, that's the that's what we should say. So uh, we have countless hypotheses. And until we have been given any particular reason to favour one of these hypotheses, um, uh, we shouldn't assign any particular hypothesis a much higher probability than any of the other hypotheses. Okay, so if, if you're going to assign a much higher probability to any of the other hypothesis to any particular hypothesis, then you've got to have some reason for doing so. Um, I, I should say I'm just outlining an argument that I think is cool. This isn't an argument that I endorse. I don't think there's anything wrong with just assigning. Uh, with just, you know, pulling a probability assignment out of thin air. Um, but, you know, just, you know, you can you can go with me. I, I think this argument is cool. So there's, yeah, brain in the vat is one hypothesis among countless number of hypotheses. There's no particular reason to favour it. So um, we should just think, okay, it's a priori highly unlikely. And, um, and then um, the question is, whether there are in fact considerations that can move that probability up and well pretty clearly there aren't right there's just there just isn't anything in particular that favors the brain in the vat hypothesis um so we should say the brain in the vat hypothesis is highly improbable the cool thing about this argument is it gets us out of the brain in the vat hypothesis but the brain in the vat is just one skeptical hypothesis among many right the brain in the vat is not itself the skeptical conclusion um, you know, skeptics will just use the brain in the vat hypothesis um, as as a way of like, uh, as really as an, an illustration. Um, so the point is, is that if you use that argument to respond to the brain in the vat hypothesis, you can now construct a very similar argument that it is very unlikely that there is an external world. It's not just that we don't know that there's an external world, it's that actually we know that there isn't an external world. Because you can say the external world hypothesis, well look, the external world hypothesis, that's just, 
you know, one hypothesis among countless numbers of hypotheses. Um, there's no particular reason to favor that hypothesis. Uh, so it's a priori, highly unlikely. Um, so, you know, you get the exact same argument, but applied to the external world. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. That's why I think that's a pretty cool argument. Um, how can you deal with the fact that you can never know if you're a brain in a vat? Why would I need to deal with it? Like, you're framing that as though it's a problem. I don't see that as a problem. That seems fine to me. Um, in fact, there are certain situations where it kind of helps to, uh, to to sort of engage with this sceptical scenario. If you're ever in a situation where you're, like, feeling, um, you know, any sort of, uh, I don't know, awkwardness like you know social embarrassment or something then uh, <clears throat> then then you know running through these sort of skeptical scenarios uh can uh can be helpful it can be kind of relieving to think that actually all of this is um you know maybe just a just a dream an hallucination <clears throat> so i think it's fine uh mia anthony phd would you ever start an only fans another only fans question lots of people apparently want to see my only fans i've answered this question uh if you look at the um the list i'll put up a list of the the answers uh it's it's in there somewhere um uh there's another only fans response um but yeah, the summary is, in principle, I'm fine with it. In practice, I mean, uh, in principle, I, I actually, I, I, I would, in practice, um, I, I don't know, I would want, I would only want to do it if I was doing it with somebody else, and I don't have anyone else to do it with, and uh, uh, yeah, it's not really something I particularly care about. I'm fine, like, not doing it. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah, probably not, is the answer. Um, Mikola Sal Salo Edov. How to be popular with girls? Well, I'll tell you what, I can't give you any advice on this. What I can say is that neither can anyone else. Um, my, uh, I, I firmly believe at this point that nobody has a fucking clue what they're talking about when it comes to uh, dating advice. Um, I, um, I'm no longer single. Uh, I, I now have a girlfriend, so I'm actually in a, a good position. But, you know, I was single for a long time and I tried out uh, lots of different things. I tried lots of different advice from lots of different people. And um, I, I gave it a, a good effort for a long time and I got absolutely nowhere. And, um, you know, the, uh, the, the advice that people gave, um, it, it just didn't help at all. Uh, and in fact, um, w the success that I have had with dating has mainly come, it's actually mainly come from my YouTube um, so, you know, I have met people, I've, like, actually, most of the women that I've met and dated, uh, it's been through YouTube. They've got in contact with me through YouTube. Um, so, I, I, I don't know, Matt, I can't help, right? <laughs> like, I may, my advice maybe is, like, I don't know, start a YouTube channel, upload videos on it every week, do that for, like, seven years, build an audience, and then maybe some of them will be interested in you. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I actually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you that advice. I wouldn't follow that. I think, you know, I, I take it that I just kind of got lucky. And I think that's, I got lucky in a certain respect. But, you know, whether this would be a plan that could work for other people, I have no idea. And nobody else has any idea either. That's one thing I am sure about. If I were you, I would just focus on doing things that you enjoy. Because... Every piece of dating advice that I've ever received has been total bullshit. Uh, Milan, why are you so handsome? I don't know, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I don't know why that. Is. I don't know why that would be though. Mohammed Sultan, sleeping beauty problem. Are you a halfer or a thirder, and why? Uh, I. D I mean, okay. I don't know a lot about this problem, um, but. Like, from the little I've read about it, it just seems kind of obvious that both are correct. It just depends on, like, how the problem is described or, you know, the point of view that you're evaluating the probability from. I mean, you know, yes, it's a fair coin. So, you know, like, I don't know, what's the... If you ask me what's the probability that the coin landed heads, then I'm going to say, well, you know, it's a fair coin. So the probability is half by definition. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I mean, I don't know. If I was, um, if I was betting on whether it landed heads or tails, uh, well, uh, 
you know, like imagine I'm betting on whether it landed heads or tails. So I'm in the Sleeping Beauty situation. I'm betting on whether it landed heads or tails. Um, I'm I'm going to earn, you know, £100 if my bet is correct and lose £100 if my bet is wrong. Well, clearly I'm going to bet on tails, right? And in fact, betting on tails would earn me a lot of money. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I'm like, that seems to... to, to Okay, well, that's that heads is two, heads is one third from that point of view. Um, I don't think that there are like I don't take probability to be objective. I don't think there are objective facts about what the probability of anything is. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm kind of happy to just say both, but I, that can't be right. I have to be missing something. Um, I'm definitely missing something. I haven't read much about this problem. I've like uh, I've heard about it. I've read you know the Wikipedia page and. Uh, uh, but that's all. Um, so I don't have anything interesting to say about this. I don't know why I'm answering this, actually. I really shouldn't. I, I'm probably uh, revealing my uh, my idiocy and ignorance. Um, oops. Um, but, uh, but yeah, what I can say is, look, uh, I'm... <laughs> like, I just think it's it just seems to depend on, like, how you choose to describe it. Uh, so, you know how you choose to describe the scenario. But that's, that's what I think. Anyway, uh, Navy Blue, do you think denying all categorical normativity is the easiest way to defend moral error theory? Well, I think it's totally reasonable. I think that's a totally reasonable way to do it. But is it the easiest way? Well, the problem is going to be like, who are you trying to convince? Because um, one of the currently most popular arguments against error theory is uh, the companions and guilt argument. And in particular, it's a companions and guilt argument which appeals to epistemic norms. It seems as though there is a, a general consensus among philosophers that it is extremely implausible to uh, uh, deny realism about epistemic norms. Now, I have no idea why that is. Um, you know, I, I remember my initial reaction to the companions and guilt argument was, um, was to, like, when I when I first heard that, I was just like, like, yeah, and, you know, like, what? Like, yeah, uh, uh, you know, so the, the argument was made that um, being a, a moral error theorist commits you to uh, being an error theorist about epistemic normativity. Um, and uh, my reaction to it was, okay, <laughs> seems fine to me. Like, what's the problem? That, that Like, of course, of course there aren't, like, what? You, wait a minute. You think it's like there are objective facts about what people ought to believe? Like, what? <laughs> um, you know, so, uh, like, to me, uh, yeah, denying all categorical normativity, that's fine. But um, it's a, a position which is um, seen as, it, it's seen to be bullet biting, right? Like, that's the problem. So, I, I don't know if that's really the, the easiest way to defend moral error theory, at least from the point of view of you know, what the, I guess, conventional views are in, um, in, in meta ethics and philosophy in general right now, because as I say, yeah, like arguments from epistemic norms, arguments uh, concerning epistemic norms are often presented as an objection to uh, moral error theory. Um, New Hendrix, how are you financially supporting yourself now that you've started, now that you've finished your PhD? How are you financially supporting yourself now that you've finished a PhD. <laughs> uh, uh, um, Nolan V, have you considered starting an OnlyFans? Also, are you ever going to get to, to do anything on the philosophy of footnotes? Um, Another OnlyFans? Why is so many people answering, asking OnlyFans question? Uh, maybe this, maybe all of these OnlyFans questions are related to this question about how I'm financially supporting myself. Um, uh, uh, anyway, I've answered that. Um, philosophy of footnotes, I don't really know what that is. I, I hate footnotes. I think that they should be eradicated. Um, I'm not sure I can do much philosophy with them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, like, yeah, I, I think that... Um, I think that they are ugly and they make it difficult to read text and that they're pointless. I think that you should, uh, if it doesn't, if it, if it's not in the main text, if it's not good enough to go in the main text, it should be cut out. And it's weird to me that this is not actually a norm already because philosophers, 
when you are educated into philosophy, you are taught to be concise, like concision is valued. Um, like, don't waffle, don't uh, like cut the crap. That's what you're told. Um, and yet when people end up as professional philosophers, they just pack their texts with these ugly footnotes. Like what the, f like, what? Yeah, so uh, I don't like footnotes, um, but I'm probably not gonna bother, you know, uh, <laughs> making a video about it or anything. Orange Replier asks, do you think anti-realists face rhetorical hurdles when they make moral claims? If so, are there good methods to overcome the hurdles? If not, why not? Um, well, yes, I think there there might well be. Uh, there are a few ways in which, um, you know, I, I think that, so outside of philosophy, this uh, isn't really a problem. Uh, I've, I've, you know, when talking to, you know, laypersons, uh, at least people who are laypersons with respect to philosophy, it's not an issue that I'm a moral anti-realist. Um, although, to be fair, I don't really talk about meta-ethics with them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think within philosophy, um, there are certain moves that realists make, which um, uh, I think kind of, uh, I want to say, like, illegitimately try to place a burden of proof on the anti-realist. So, um, so first of all, there's, um, this isn't something that I, I, at least I don't think this is something you find so much in the published literature, but it's certainly something I've encountered in, <clears throat> in just kind of discussions, which is, you know, realists, uh, seem to engage in what uh, Lance Bush, he has a nice name for this, he calls it normative entanglement, which is conflating um, normative ethics with meta-ethics. So, you know, you 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 sort of present the anti-realist with a question like, well, you know, do you think it's immoral to torture children for fun? And then, um, I mean, if the anti-realist was to say no, then, of course, they sound um, completely... Uh, 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 repugnant, you know, it's a, it's a, just just an appalling position. Um, if they say yes, then that's treated as an intuition in favour of realism. So it's treated as some sort of concession to realism. Uh, the the anti-realist grants that, of course, it's immoral to uh, uh, torture children for fun. Um, uh, so it's, I mean, but of course, you know, it is immoral to torture children for fun. Well, that's just a first order normative claim, and that's actually compatible with a whole bunch of different uh, meta-ethics, including uh, a whole bunch of anti-realist uh, meta-ethical views. <clears throat> um, but the way that, so, I mean, you get, it's similarly, you know, if you if you consider a question like, well, is it objectively wrong to uh, torture children for fun? Then, um, you know, like, again, there's, it, it, Obviously, an anti-realist will have to say no to that, right? Uh, they don't think anything is objectively wrong. Um, but uh, it's, it's this, it, the, the problem is, is that, you know, there are certain conversational contexts where asking that question can be sort of used to imply that really they're denying that it's just that it's wrong to talk to children for fun, right? Um, so, yeah, this sort of normative entanglement, this like... Um, kind of conflation of uh, normative ethics with meta-ethics, I think, is is problematic. The other thing that's problematic is I think anti-realists have accepted um, certain burdens of proof, which I, I don't think they should have done. Um, so uh, th there's a sort of line of argument which says that, well, anti-realism bears the burden of proof because realism is the common sense position. You know, re so realism is just common sense. And, um, you know, prima facie, we, you know, you, you, you go with, uh, you go with common sense in the absence of, of defeaters. Um, and I don't think that's actually true. I mean, so first of all, it's not obvious to me that we should go with common sense. Uh, but that, you know, we should think that the uh, anti-commonsensical views bear the burden of proof. But even putting that aside, um, I don't think it's true that realism is in fact commonsensical. Um, the, you know, the empirical evidence which has examined folk meta-ethics, which has examined uh, layperson's views on meta-ethics, is, I think, at best, um, it, it shows that people's views are sort of indeterminate, that, you know, sometimes people are inclined to realism, sometimes they're inclined to anti-realism. Actually, um, if anything, I think the evidence is pointing more towards 
uh, people, uh, you know, laypersons holding um, more or less anti-realist views. But um, certainly, I mean, there is no general consensus in favour of realism. Realism is not the common sense position. Um, but it does seem that a lot of anti-realists have just accepted that it is and so it's it's like the the anti-realists have kind of have just accepted that they they have like a challenge there's this challenge that they have to you, you know show uh how to kind of accommodate realist intuitions um you know i and that i just don't think that's necessary um now i mean how you overcome hurdles like this is i guess just by pointing them out and <laughs> uh, I mean, you just have to sort of hope that uh, that we're not going to uh, allow realists to control the conversation in the way that they have done. Um, that, you know, we're going to, um, you know, may maybe have a bit more like uh, uh, a bit more epistemic responsibility in how we talk about these things. Um, I don't know what, what more you can do other than just point these things out and, um, you know, hope that the conversation changes. Um Okay, Petros Petru Petru. Hi, existence has always interested me. Can you make a presentation about it? I'm afraid I don't have any plans to do that. Um, that's not something I'm I'm currently planning, and um, I so you know sorry. <laughs> uh, Fan Trong, are we humans or are we dancer? Okay, now now listen. Um, I don't mind people making references to you know artworks, songs, uh, things like that on my channel, but. Um, it really should be quite clear uh, if, if you watch my videos. You can see that my I have a certain kind of aesthetic taste, right? You know, there's certain uh, types of art that I, uh, I'm, I'm interested in. Um, you know, there's a certain perspective that I, I have on aesthetics and art. And, um, you know, uh, um, I, I, I think that while it's fine, right, to be, you know, posting song lyrics, um, don't be posting song lyrics from such shit songs, okay? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have to ban you. Uh, if you do that again, look, I'll give you a warning, right? This is the warning, okay? But just bear that in mind, okay? So if you do that again, then you're going to get... But if I hear that again, then you're getting booted, all right? Because that song is a pile of fucking shit. I do not want that on my channel. I'm sorry, I have to maintain certain aesthetic standards in my community okay so there's 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 no uh, look i don't want any uh any racists in my community i don't want any sexists uh i don't want you know transphobes i'm at least i'm gonna I, i'm gonna do what i can to discourage that stuff but i especially don't want people posting lyrics from shitty songs okay so uh anyway i hope we, we, we're clear about that um right I'm only joking, of course. Well, I mean, I'm not joking. I, uh, uh, that song is absolutely awful. Uh, I don't know why you posted that. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not really going to ban you. Um, okay, Philosopher Phillips. What do philosophers mean by metaphysical possibility and what other modal terms struggle having clear standards defined? Well, metaphysical possibility is is tricky uh, and I'm, I'm really not the best person to ask about this because, you know, like, I have crazy views on modality. Um, but, uh, you know, I can try to motivate the distinction in the way that it's usually motivated. So consider the question of whether it is possible to exceed the speed of light. Uh, so is it possible to exceed the speed of light? Like, can an object, you know, could I travel faster than light? Well, doing that would violate the laws of physics. It's not, so it's not physically possible. Um, so uh, there, there is a, a space of physical possibility which is defined by what is allowable within the laws of physics as they currently are, you know, as, as they are in this world. Um, but the laws of physics might have been different, presumably. Um, you know, I mean, maybe if uh, the initial conditions of the universe were different, or maybe if, if there's a god and, you know, god brought the world into existence, maybe uh, god could have made a world with different laws of physics, and in such a world, perhaps things could exceed the speed of light. Um, so, you know, if you imagine a, a world with different laws, then you are, ma you are imagining a world which is physically impossible, but maybe it's, it's not like impossible simpliciter, all right? Maybe it's metaphysically possible. Um, you know, there, there could have been such a world in the broadest sense of 
could have been. There could have been a world where the laws of physics allowed you to travel faster than light. On the other hand, take um, an identification such as, uh, I don't know, water equals H2O. Um, well, the, the idea with something like this is water just is H2O. Like we made an empirical discovery and, and the discovery is that water just is H2O. These things are identical. So actually, if you're imagining, so you can imagine a world where, uh, you know, there's water-like stuff which has a different underlying constitution, but it wouldn't actually be water. You know, if, if there's no H2O, there's no water. And that's the case in every possible world. And even if you play around with the laws of physics, you can't change this. So we could change, we could change the laws of physics so that, um, you know, so that H2O2 had water-like properties. Like maybe we could do that. Maybe we could like alter the laws of physics in such a way that, you know, H2O2 um, was the stuff that organisms like us, you know, would drink and it would quench their thirst and so on. Um, but then it, it wouldn't be water, right? That They would just wouldn't be drinking water. So in every possible world, water is H2O. So it is uh, metaphysically necessary that water is H2O. Metaphysically possible that uh, things can exceed the speed of light. Metaphysically necessary that water is H2O. Um, well, you know, look, I don't know. That's the sort of motivation for thinking of metaphysical possibility. Metaphysical possibility is a broader kind of possibility than physical possibility, uh, than, than what is possible in terms of physical law. So I think of it as like, you know, when you're imagining possible worlds which have different physical laws, you're playing around with uh, metaphysical possibility. Uh, you also ask, what does epistemic possibility mean? Epistemic possibility is a matter of um, you know, what could be true given our current beliefs. Um, so, you know, based on what I currently believe, but like based on my current perspective, the, the knowledge that I currently have, um, it's possible that my brother is in the kitchen. It's possible that my brother is, uh, is, is in the living room. Um, it's not possible that my brother is in the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, there's no way that could happen. Uh, you know, given the fact that I saw my brother uh, just... <laughs> just five minutes ago, uh, given the fact that, you know, that the human beings can't get to the Andromeda galaxy and it's, you know, four billion light years away, whatever. Um, yeah, that's, so it's, epistemic possibility is just a matter of like, you know, what might be the case given what uh, our current sort of state of evidence or state of knowledge or state of belief is. Um, okay, Planky A. Akinthasta, um, do you like starfishes? I mean, I'm assuming based on your username that uh, this is not a euphemism for buttholes, which is a shame because, um, uh, you know, I, I'd be, I kind of would, would rather talk about buttholes. But uh, no, I do. I like starfishes. Starfishes are pretty cool. I don't really know much about them, but, you know, uh, they get a thumbs up from me. Uh, would you like to discuss theism or morality with YouTuber Distributist? Sure, I guess. I mean, I'm not really that... I, I don't know. I don't really have uh, much to say about theism um, or morality, for that matter. Um, but, uh, I mean, if somebody wants to talk about them with me, I guess I don't have any... I don't rule it out in principle. So, you know, um, would be up to them, I suppose. Uh, pomegranate, do you like mac and cheese? I don't eat mac and cheese much. I, I, I haven't really had it. Um, I've, I mean, I think I've had it a couple of times, but it obviously didn't leave an impression. So maybe the answer is no. Um, it's it's obviously not something... I mean, I must have had it. I'm 31 years old. I must have eaten it in my life. But clearly it's not something that I have uh, been uh, uh, drawn back to. Um, PSM Alg 5... <laughs> Uh, what books do you recommend for the rise of the nation state? Bro, I, I don't know what channel you think you're on here. Why would I know anything about the rise of the nation state? I have, I have not, I, like what? <laughs> uh, Radical Democrat. Best books you've read recently? Um, I don't know, I haven't read a lot of books recently. Uh, Genuinely, I actually haven't. I haven't read much recently. I, I read uh, David Chalmers' Reality Plus, and I thought it was great fun. I thought it was uh, a lot of really interesting arguments. There's a lot of terrible arguments in there as well, actually. But there was a lot of interesting arguments. And, um, you know, I like, uh, yeah, I, you know, I thought it's very well written. Chalmers is a very, very smart guy. Um, I thought it was 
uh, it, it, it's both sort of philosophically sophisticated, but also written in a very accessible way. It was actually fun to read. It's not very often that, you know, you can sit down with some philosophy and it'd just be really, really fun to read. But I thought Re Reality Plus was a lot of fun. Um, what else have I read recently? I don't know. I, I uh, really not been not been reading many books. I mean, I read articles. I read a lot of articles, but um, haven't really sat down with a with a book in a in a while. Um, Rack who geo? Do you think there could be an exception to Rule Thirty Four and Thirty Five of the Internet? Uh, I mean, it says no exceptions, right? I'll say an interesting feature of uh, Rule Thirty Four and Thirty Five um, is that you know if we take a charitable interpretation of these rules, if we apply Grice's conversational maxims to these rules, then these rules in conjunction um, do uh, at least implicate a commitment to Meinongianism. Uh, they, uh, in conjunction, would implicate a commitment to non-existent objects. Um, so, you know, if only Kant and Frege and Russell had properly investigated the metaphysics of internet pornography, philosophy might have gone in a very different direction. Uh, what do you think is the ideal bedtime? Um, 6 a.m., 7 a.m. Uh, Ramon, what are your thoughts on the Russian-Ukrainian war of the present? Well, uh, there are some that there are some restrictions actually on what can be said about this. Um, channels that have monetization, there's a if you if you go on the monetization thing, it has like a little warning about uh, talking about the uh, the, the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, so I'm not going to talk about Russia and Ukraine, but I, I'll i just talk abstractly about my, my stance on war. Um, I would say that I'm basically a pacifist, and, uh, you know, I think if, if you imagine what somebody who's basically a consistent pacifist would, you know, say about uh, uh, this situation, I think it's, it's pretty obvious the judgment they would make. Uh, I mean, again, if somebody's just opposed to war... Um, Okay, so, uh, look, uh, okay, let's imagine a smaller country being invaded by a larger one. What should the smaller country do? We've got, we've got some horrible, you know, shithead dictator who's invading a, uh, in, invading a smaller country, trying to grab their land. What should the smaller country do? I think they should surrender. Um, that's what I would do. Uh, I'd, I wouldn't want to fight. Um, and not only... So I, I would not want to fight. Um, I would prefer to surrender. I also think that it is m morally repugnant to uh, force other people to fight, which is, you know, I mean, if, if you have, uh, if, you, if you're going to that, if you're having that kind of war, if you're having a war where it's like, you know, the, a country is, you know, literally under an existential threat, then if you're going to fight for the country, it's probably going to involve conscripting people. And uh, I think that is um, that is disgusting. Uh, that is appalling. Um, and I, w I so I wouldn't support that. I think I think I would be in favour of uh, of surrendering. Um, I think that being the puppet state of a shithead dictator is uh, bad, but it's better than being bombed into oblivion. Um, it's better than forcing people to fight in war. I think I. That's my, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, look, I'm not saying anything about Russia and Ukraine, but, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't like war, right? I don't like war. Um, I think it's a little bit puzzling why, um, why there are, like, I used to think there were, like, a lot of people who didn't like war, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Seems like almost everybody, like, really actually is kind of just keen on war, um, uh, even when, you know, it's resulting in, you know, just like uh, obliterate. Let me be clear about this, right? I think that, uh, I think Russia is awful. I think Putin is awful. Um, but I think, you know, would I, am I, would I want to fight? Would I want to put my life on the line? No. Would I expect anyone else to put their life on the line? Absolutely not. Um, so that's my stance. Anyway, Richard, uh, would, what do you think about Peter Unger's claim in Empty Ideas, i.e. that modern academic philosophy failed to deliver any meaningful idea about the world? World. Well, you know, I don't actually know um, his work. Uh, I, I, so I, I don't know. I mean, I actually can't comment because, because I don't know. Um, so I suppose I should, I should move on. It seems 
it seems kind of implausible, right? Like I think there, I think there are many philosophical debates that are sort of merely semantic, but I, I don't know. I like, I think there's plenty of philosophy out there where it seems like people are having pretty substantive debates. They're addressing substantive questions. But as I said, I mean, I can't talk about this because I don't actually know his arguments. So I, I just have to move on. Okay, Richard Sear. Ah, uh, dude, what is this question, bro? If you flip a coin n times where there are two, two to the power of n possible outcomes if order matters, for example, flipping the coin three times equals two to the power of three equals eight possible out... Bro, dude, I've been answering like... I've been... I can't think... I can't... I can't do this question. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't do like... I can't do it. I just can't do it. Uh... So what is, okay, let me, let me, let me try to read this. I'm going to try to get through this. Um, okay, so uh, if you flip a coin, for example, flipping a coin three times equals two to the power of three equals eight possible outcomes. If you flip a coin zero times, you get two to the power of zero equals one possible outcome, nothing. But it seems like you could also say that you've got zero outcomes because you didn't even flip the coin. What am I missing here? Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like you can... I mean, yeah, you could, but like, that's clearly just a matter of convention, isn't it? I mean, like, whether you count that as one outcome or zero outcomes is, like, that's just up to you. Um, I don't think there's a fact of the matter. Maybe I am misinterpreting the question. So, if you flip a coin zero times, you get two to the power of zero equals one outcome equals nothing. But it seems like you could also say you've got zero outcomes I mean, yeah, yeah, you, well, yeah, sure. I mean, you can do, yeah, you could say either. Um, right. <laughs> Sorry, man, I, I'm, um, I, I, I'm not sure, like, what the point is. Like, what are we driving at here? What are we driving at with this question? What's the context for this? Um, and I'm not sure I'm interpreting it correctly either. I can't work numbers in my head at the moment. Um, <clears throat> Roman Bezil, uh, Bezel, what are some positions you like in philosophy and mathematics with regard to ontology, uh, e.g. good alien platonism, structuralism, etc.? Well, you know, I would certainly want to, I would certainly want to resist the postulation of objective entities or objective structures. Um, you know, I'm, I'm generally an empiricist and anti-realist. I'm inclined to constructivism with respect to mathematics. I, I probably want to say something like, you know, mathematics begins with, uh, with abstraction, it, it sort of begins with, you know, us, us kind of like interacting with, with physical things and working with physical things and then making abstractions, like we perform abstractions in our heads. Um, that's how it begins. We like abstract certain structures, certain patterns, and then we elaborate on them, you know, like playing a game, you know, we elaborate the consequences of them. Um, maybe I, I'd end up with a kind of fictionalism. I'm... Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, I mean, certainly, like I said, I, I I would want to resist sort of treating it as you know true as sort of providing true descriptions of platonic entities or true descriptions of objective structures. Um, but you know, I I don't really have enough expertise in in this to come down clearly on any specific view. Um, I, I maybe I I would end up inclined to some sort of fictionalism. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess that, I guess, I guess that would be it. Uh, Ryan Balon, are you vegan? If not, what is the morally relevant trait that separates non-human animals and human animals? I know you are a moral anti-realist, but you presumably have a system of ethics which you use in everyday life, even if it, even if it is a helpful fiction. Uh, no, I don't, I don't need a system of ethics. Uh, the older I get, the less I care about doing that. Why, why would I need to do that? What's the point? What is the point of moral system building? Why can't like why what why would I do that? Uh, I mean I mean I like look I get that philosophers enjoy moral system building. It's really important to philosophers that they have you know uh, like a certain set of moral principles and then you know those those and then their principles are all shown to be internally consistent and you know those principles tell them what to do in every every possible situation and but I I mean you, you can do that if you want but. I don't know. I just, I, I don't see why I would have to have to do that. Like I can, um, so uh, to answer the question, I'm, I'm not vegan. Um, I am vegetarian. I went, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons why, uh, I, I favor vegetarianism, which is, 
Um, I, first of all, um, find it just easier. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to uh, uh, prepare food without meat. Um, and I don't particularly care about meat. I don't like meat that much. Um, so, you know, it was easy enough to go vegetarian. And it seems like we should move away from animal agriculture. I think it would be good, actually, if everybody was vegan. I think, you know, if I could sort of push a button and make everybody vegan, I would. And I would do it because I think that the animal agriculture just seems to be a disaster for the environment. And it seems like that's a, you know, moving away from animal agriculture is a relatively easy change we could make um, that would have significant positive consequences. It wouldn't solve the problem entirely. I mean, the environment is totally fucked. We'd have to do a lot more than just move away from animal agriculture. But that is a significant thing we could make. And it doesn't seem like it would have significant costs. It seems like it's, uh, you know, relatively... Uh, cost-free change um, moving away from animal agriculture. So I, I actually would like it if everyone was vegan. But here's the thing. Um, it isn't the case that everyone's vegan. We are on a path right now where it seems like we're just obliterating the planet anyway. Um, I mean, if every... Look, as far as I'm concerned, if a bunch of fucking massive corporations get to wreck the environment... Um, why is it only them that get to have all the fun? I should be able to have fun as well, right? So, uh, you know, if we're, if we're going to destroy the planet anyway, I, I might as well, uh, I, might, I might as well have some fun too. And part of the things that I find fun is drinking milk and eating eggs. I love eggs and I love milk. Um, I did try the uh, vegan milks and, um, and, you know, some of them tasted okay. Almond milk tasted tasted okay. Coconut milk was pretty tasty but I mean they're just I mean they're not milk they're not milk I remember trying for like a month some of those vegan milks and uh when I when I went back to actual milk uh it was just oh my god it was divine I mean it was it was so tasty I so you know environment's fucked anyway so I'm I'm not going to stop drinking milk if everybody if everybody else stopped drinking milk I would too but until then I'm going to have fun. Uh, I'm going to have fun. So, um, yeah, now, uh, so obviously, uh, you know, there's the there's this environmentalist point. So, you know, I, I occupy this position where like, OK, you know, I'll give up meat, but uh, you know, I'm not really going to do that much. And then um, uh, you're obviously coming at this from a, a sort of animal rights point of view. Um, I just don't really care about animals that much. Um, and uh, I mean, what's the morally re the morally relevant trait that separates non-human animals and human animals? Um, I mean, I, what, I can just arbitrarily favour humans. Like, I can just say I prefer, I, I favour humans, that's it. Uh, I don't see why I have, like, why would I have to pick out some morally relevant trait? I can just favour humans. So, um I do actually, I have actually addressed this point, I should say. I, I have attempted in the past to uh, engage in the sort of moral system building. I have a video called Animals Don't Matter. But that video is, I wouldn't say that it makes sort of, I don't know if I would say that it's like, it makes errors, It's but it I, it's not, it doesn't feel honest. Um, it doesn't feel honest. Because the honest truth is that, you know, my, I don't actually endorse any particular moral system. Right? I just sort of, feel ways about things and you know, that's it you know and I, I just happen to favor humans and that's it um and there's not really you know I mean yeah I can I can come up I can invent some system which you know like has certain principles and then from the principles you get a justification for, for but like what what's the point why would I what, why would I need to do that um uh, I mean, but incidentally, I, I like I want the vegans to win anyway. So uh, you know, I, I just see no need to, um, to 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 yeah engage in this sort of system building. Uh, Ryan Hauger, have you ever thought about starting an OnlyFans? Another OnlyFans question. Lots of people want to see my OnlyFans. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, S three Rios. Um, my question. In a recent video, you mentioned being attracted to panpsychism. Can you elaborate on some of your reasons for this? Okay, uh, I want to be clear about this, that um, I'm not a panpsychist. Um, it was, it's, it's, uh, I, I worry about this because people are starting to attribute panpsychism to me. And it's more just like, you know, if I had to take a bet on it, if I had to bet 
on a particular theory of mind, then I'd probably bet on panpsychism. But I don't really know much about panpsychism. I haven't, and, and I haven't, in general, I haven't been keeping up with philosophy of mind. Uh, uh, like, I haven't read much of it over the last, like, seven, eight years, you know? Um, I... I've read a couple of articles on panpsychism. I remember I did a uh, reading group thing on uh, Strawson's, on one of Galen Strawson's articles defending panpsychism, and that's, I got a video on that actually. So I, I guess if you typed in, you know, Kane B panpsychism reading group, you'll find that. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, think, I think it's an interesting position, but I don't really know much about it. Um, but okay, why, why would I take a bet on it? Well, I think that first of all, it's just hard. So here's a couple of things. It's it's hard to see how sort of awareness or consciousness could be something that like developed gradually. Um, like it, it, you know, it it seems like okay. So minds, right? I can see how minds can develop. Right? Minds can go from like simple to more sophisticated. But the thing is, is that no, no matter how like simple or sophisticated my mind is, there seems to be there's like just there's this awareness or this consciousness um, and it seems like that could be arbitrarily simple um, if, you know so like right now my mind is you know my, my conscious state is extremely sophisticated you know, I'm engaging in uh, you know theoretical reasoning I, I have all sorts of very complex perceptions I have various feelings you know I've, I've recently just eaten dinner and so I'm, I'm feeling sort of satiated I, I have various emotional feelings you know. so there's all sorts of things going on in consciousness but then there's that just, there's that awareness, right? There's like an awareness, a consciousness of all of this stuff going on. And then that stuff can simplify, you know, like when I, uh, you know, if I, if I go to bed, if I, if I go to sleep, mind shuts down, you know, like the uh, belief sort of shut down, theoretic, like the theoretical reasoning shuts down, but there's still this just kind of awareness, like there's, yeah, there's like an aware, just awareness, right? It seems like awareness could be arbitrarily simple. In fact, it might be that awareness is sort of, sort of nothingness. I mean, that's kind of the message of like, you know, the Hume and, and Hume's account of the self or, you know, like Buddhist accounts of the self um, is that, you know, like there's, there's stuff that's kind of happening in the mind. And then there's like just this awareness, um, and the awareness doesn't seem to have any substantive properties at all. Um, and so, so the point is, is that, you know, it doesn't, I, and it's like, it's not, it's not easy for me to see, like, how, I don't know, I just intuitively feel like this isn't something that could, like, develop gradually. It just seems like it's, you know, it's there, it's just there. And so, you know, it's like at what point, so, you know, if we kind of think back over evolutionary history, you know, you can you can go go back down the line um all the way down to bacteria and eventually just down to you know inanimate particles um and at, like what point in that in that process does like awareness switch on like why would there be a point it seems like things so you know these mental properties would get simpler and simpler and simpler but um even no matter how simple the mental properties get like there seems to be just this awareness um I mean, I don't know, right? That's just, a, again, it's just an intuition. I don't really know. I have no idea. I'm, I'm just explaining why I would kind of take a bet on it. Um, the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, we don't have um, any direct experience of uh, non-consciousness. I mean, that's in principle something that we just never have any direct experience of. Um, the only things that at best we can do is, is make an inference to it. So, you know, I, I can like make an inference and say well like maybe when i'm in deep sleep um i'm just non-conscious or non-aware right consciousness is completely obliterated um but i mean that's i like that's just that's one interpretation among many um i could equally uh, account for what happens during deep sleep by saying that there is awareness it's just a very simple awareness and then there's no memory right like so um, like I just don't form memories during deep sleep. So there's awareness during deep sleep, but then I lose memory of it. That's a, that's another perfectly reasonable account, it seems to me, of what's going on. So um, there's no... The point is, is that to say that something is non-conscious or non-aware, um, that's always going to be... There's like some inference that we're making to that. 
But then, I don't know, why, why postulate this? Why postulate non-awareness or non-consciousness? Just seems completely unnecessary. Like, so what, so we know that there are types of matter that are conscious. Um, I mean, or maybe not matter. Uh, <laughs> maybe there is no matter. But whatever your metaphysics is, we know that there's stuff. There's stuff that's conscious. There's stuff that's aware. Uh, and we know that this consciousness can manifest itself in more or less complex ways. Uh, and there's no direct, and there can in principle never be any direct experience of non-consciousness. Um, it's just a postulation, right? So but, but, but why, why do that? We don't need to postulate any other types of, of matter. Uh, like we, we just don't need to. Um, so why, why would you? And, you know, if you do postulate it, if you do postulate that some stuff is non-aware or non-conscious, well, now there is a kind of explanatory problem because you've got to explain, like, like what's, why is there this difference, right? Why do you, end, wh like, why do you get awareness or consciousness um, out of some bits of matter and not others? Uh, so I guess but, but basically the thing here is, and, you know, again, this isn't really an argument for panpsychism. It's just something that would make me bet on it is I, it just doesn't seem necessary to postulate uh, non-aware matter, right? Like like non-conscious matter. That seems like a, a, an unnecessary metaphysical addition. Um, so, yeah, and then there's just the fact that it seems as though the main argument that most people have against panpsychism is uh is that it's it's silly or that it's absurd um and i just i don't know i just don't see why it is seems perfectly fine to me um i like yeah i mean i don't know why why not it, it, it I, I i i really do not share the uh the incredulous stare um uh towards panpsychism it strikes me as you know, no, at least like prima facie, um, no, you know, more or less plausible than basically any other theory of mind. Um, so uh, I, 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 I guess that's that's why that's why I would I would bet on it. Um, but don't attribute the position to me. It's not a position that I endorse. It's it's more like if, you know, I had a gun to my head and I had to make a decision, then um, I probably just bet I probably bet on panpsychism. It, that's and that's why. Um, Sasha, what advice would you give to a student wishing to become an academic? Would you even recommend it? Um, I don't give advice. That's not something I do. So um, I I really wouldn't do that. Uh, 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 would I recommend it? Well, what I would say is that based on my experience in academia, I I I, I would. I mean, if you if you want, you know, so I don't know. I mean, if somebody wants to, um, if somebody really loves a subject and they're able to fund it, then why the hell not? I mean, I had great fun uh, doing philosophy academically. It was it was it was wonderful, you know, and I um, I had funding for it. So there was no worries about money. Um, it was, a, I think, a good idea, a good idea for me to do it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's. Uh, look, I'm sorry. I, I, I feel bad because um, I just don't like giving advice. All right. I'm sorry. I'm not really answering the question, but I really don't. I don't like playing the role of uh, I, that's not a role I'm comfortable with because uh, everybody's situation is different. I don't really know your situation. Um, you know, the kind of advice that would be appropriate uh, in the United Kingdom, for instance, is very different from what might be appropriate in the United States or in Europe, right? Academia works differently in different places. I don't, I don't know you personally. I don't know your situation. I don't know the country you're in. Don't know what your plans are. I, it, I think, it, I just feel like it would be irresponsible actually for me to, for me to give advice uh, to you. Um, and actually, even when I do know all of that stuff, I don't like giving advice. Um, Sadon. Magadon. Uh, Star Wars nerd here. I would love to hear you talk about the Jedi and Sith philosophies and see if you can pick out the good and bad from each. Um, I don't actually even know what a Jedi or a Sith is, so unfortunately I can't talk about those things. Uh, Sime Bat. Um, do you think 
the ideal world for Homo sapiens will be the one where there is least need for metaphysical abstractions. I mean, I don't know what the problem with metaphysical abstractions would be. I like metaphysics. I mean, I don't agree with it, but I like it. I think it's fun. I think it's a fun thing to engage in. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, look, many of my favourite philosophy books are books of metaphysics. Um, uh, okay, so... Like 40,000 years ago, when humans were hunter-gatherers and hadn't started those burial rituals, paintings, ornaments, clothes, and most probably hadn't invented any gods, etc., because technically speaking, modern human anatomy and neural structures haven't developed for the complexity of modernity. Our material... Okay. These questions are, you know, like, I don't know, man. Like, you want to get them a bit simpler, really. Um, like, you're kind of... I don't know, dude. The way that this works, it's like... Uh, it's probably better if you can just sort of get a, you know, a sentence or two. Because um, this is a bit like... I don't know what to do with this. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the, the question bit. <laughs> um... Shouldn't the ultimate quality of a society be how less people attempt to change that society? We've been trying to change our society since we settled in villages, and ironically, with more progress, we have tried to change it more. Is that urge for change just a symptom of Homo sapiens not being in their natural equilibrium? Well, you know, I mean, I like change, so I just don't see what the problem here is. Uh, you know, not not all changes are good. In fact, I think in many ways society is changing in ways that are very bad. But, uh, you know, I mean, change in general, I think change is cool. And actually, you know, there was plenty of change going on even during hunter-gatherer times. I don't think that there's really such a thing as, like, natural equilibrium. Um, you know, the notion of there being a sort of balance of nature um, is something that uh, has... Uh, I think, fallen out of favour in ecology these days. Um, it, you know, the, any any sort of ecosystem is just in, in flux. And, um, the, I mean, there are examples of sort of species that have just remained the same for a long period of time. You know, crocodiles, I think, have been basically the same for the last 150 million years, but um, at least in terms of their, uh, you know, their morphology. Um, but... Um, yeah, no, like ecosystems just just change, and and you know if you look at human history, well, it's not as though there was any time in human history where uh, you know things were just fixed for like like semi permanently. I mean, we've con like from the very beginning, uh, we have been. We have been exploring the world and altering the world and altering our environments. And of course, that change has accelerated in certain respects um, very significantly. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think this notion of um, just there being like some sort of natural equilibrium between humans and the environment is uh, is a bit naive, really. You, you know, uh, I, I don't know if that's really ever sustainable because... The, the environment is like in constant flux. So even if the even if human beings could somehow, you know, occupy some special niche in an ecosystem and it's like, OK, we have we have a stable niche in this ecosystem, but everything else in the ecosystem is is going to change, too. Um, you know, so, yeah, um, I'm not I'm not really worried about change. And I don't think uh, it's it seems futile to me to. Um, to try to stop it. Uh, Samia Ayer Majid. Does economics make progress? If so, what is the nature of economic truth? I'm inclined to say, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm inclined to think that there's just no such thing as progress. I'm not sure that progress is really a, a helpful way of conceiving of what goes on in any scientific field. Um, uh, but the, I, I also wouldn't really think of truth as being like, um, domain specific so I, I don't know I mean I don't really think there's like economic truth and chemical truth and physical truth I mean there's just like you know there's just truth and then there are truths of economics there are truths of chemistry there are truths of physics uh, or truths discovered by those uh, by those sciences or maybe I should say truths constructed by those sciences but um, but yeah I, I don't really know what like economic truth would be um, and as, yeah, as for progress, uh, I would be inclined to say that, yeah, no, it doesn't make progress, but then I don't really think of anything at all as making progress. Um, Savas Saka for us, are you thinking of making DIY videos? No. Uh, Scrubbles by 
DJ Gunbound. Could you talk about Graham Priest's conclusion about everything and nothing in Germany? Robert Curtius Lecture of Excellence 2017 at the International Centre of Philosophy NRW at Bonn University. I haven't seen it, so I, I can't talk about that, no. Um, Seb M. How does causal anti-realism even work? It seems like we can give an almost complete explanation of most phenomena by positing a causal story of why said phenomena exists. If you deny the existence of causality, then it seems we have massively reduced our ability to explain anything for seemingly no reason. So on the, uh, on the causal anti-realist view, um, things just happen. Right, there are like things just happen. There are, there are, there are some regularities. Um, yes, but I mean, there's no sort of you know metaphysical glue that ties uh, one thing to another thing. Uh, consider, um, you know, watching a movie. Right, like let's say you sit down and you watch a movie. Now, even on the standard view of causality, there isn't actually any causal connection between the frames of the film. Right. So if you're if you're watching a film and it's projected like 24 frames a second. Right. Well, each frame is uh, is is independent. I mean, they have a common cause, of course, but you wouldn't say that the things in frame A have caused the things in frame B. Right. Like, I mean, and, and that's the case even on the standard view. Um, there's not going to be a direct causal connection between these frames. Um, but of course, we can still think of we can still like interpret what's going on in the movie in causal terms so you know um like when when the film shows somebody throwing a ball and the ball hits a window we might still say you know the ball has caused the window to break notice that um what's going on there is we're not just so we're kind of projecting causality onto the frames we're not just projecting causality onto the frames we're also projecting uh, objects uh, onto the frames because obviously there isn't really a ball. Um, there's not actually a ball there. Uh, there's not actually a window there. No, it's um, it, it, you know I, I don't know. It's just a screen, right? <laughs> just a screen with light being projected on it. Um, and so, uh, so the thing is, is that when uh, the, the point of this analogy is, look, um, when you are watching this movie, right? Uh, of course, we naturally think of what's going on in causal terms, but again, even on the standard view of causality, there's no actual causal connections in the way that you are like just in naturally inclined to describe it, right? It's, it's not that there's a ball causing a window to break. Um, so, you know, the, the, the thought of like causal anti-realism is well, you know, yeah, like the things, things just happen, <laughs> okay? And the and, and of course, um, it, you know, causality is an extremely useful concept. Um, it's very useful for human beings to distinguish, you know, causes from correlations. That's, that's very useful in uh, modelling the world. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see why we'd, we'd sort of be forced to uh, take it that causality is an objective feature of the world. Uh, now, of course, there's, there's, you know, many ways of sort of filling out this story in deeper ways. Um, you know, why do we make causal claims, uh, for instance? Well, you know, there's lots you might say there. Um, so the early example would be something like Humean projectivism. Um, constant conjunctions between A and B set up a habit in the mind so that on seeing A, on observing A, the imagination is drawn towards B. And it's that feeling of anticipation, that expectation of B on seeing A, uh, that leads, the, leads to the judgment that A causes B. Or that there's a necessary connection between A and B. So, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, no, I, I think that that view is probably somewhat naive. Uh, I'm, I, I don't think that that constructive proposal actually works. But the, um, but yeah, I mean, the point is that uh, I don't really think there's any sort of obvious difficulty in just saying, well, you know, look, there are events occurring in the world, things happen in the world. And, um, you know, causality is a feature of our models, or it's something that we project onto the world. Um, now, as for this point about explanation, so I would just say that there's no need for explanations to be true, 
So, um, so yes, you're, you're right. We can, you know, you say we can give an almost complete explanation of most phenomena by positing a causal story of why the phenomena exists. Um, yeah, uh, certainly causal explanations are uh, very powerful, very important. Um, but explanations can be useful. They can be pragmatically useful, even if they're not true. Um, you know, you can use Newton's theory to explain the, you know, the tides or the motion of the planets or whatever. Um, but we don't take it that uh, Newton's theory is true. So um, I, I think that explanations can be non-factive um, and still be perfectly acceptable as explanations. Um, and so I, I, I certainly don't think that I'm that, you know, to be a causal anti-realist is to reduce our ability to explain anything. We can carry on. We can go ahead and make all sorts of explanations. We can carry on making explanations of things. Um, it's just that the explanations would be taken in a non-factive way. We, would, we wouldn't say that the explanations are true. Um, so, yeah, that's causal anti-realism. Spezzi, who do you think are the most overrated philosophers, either modern or historical? I'm sure I had this question earlier, although there's been so many questions now. I'm 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 starting to uh, l lose my uh, lose my mind a little bit. Uh, so uh, yes, no, I did I did have this question earlier. So I might just link to uh, to that question. Um, it, you'll you'll see it in the in the question list. Uh, you know, overrated philosophers. Um, I gave G. E. Moore and Ludwig Wittgenstein, I, I think, um, as overrated ones. Um, Stefan Travis, are the philosophies are there are there are there philosophies that you find morally aberrant but intellectually respectable? For example, Plato's Republic, Hobbes' War, War of All Against All, Rousseau's Natural Man, nihilistic interpretations of Derrida's work. Um, Ah, I don't know, you know, I'm kind of split on this. I mean, there's part of me that wants to say, well, no, because I just think that, you know, anything that goes on in your own, in your mind, anything that happens in your mind is fine. You know, like it, it, all beliefs are in principle morally acceptable as long as they remain beliefs, right? Like all, so like the, like an idea just on its own, um, even, even like Nazism, uh, even fascism and terrible things like that. Um, in themselves, like just as things out there, are not uh, are not actually terrible. And in fact, even if there's you know some some belief in somebody's mind in one of these things, um, that's not in itself morally aberrant. Like I don't. There's part of me that wants to say I don't make a moral judgment about people's beliefs uh, or about anything going on in a person's mind. I, I would certainly make moral judgments about actions that people perform on the basis of their beliefs. You know, if somebody holds Nazi beliefs and then they go ahead and actually start, you know, uh, trying to uh, exterminate Jewish people or whatever, then uh, I'm going to have a big problem with that. Um, but, uh, you know, or even if they just try to promote Nazism, you know, if they start speaking Nazism, then maybe I'm going to have a problem with that. I'm going to object to that. But like just having the belief in the head uh, I, or, or just having the idea there, I don't know if, um, I don't know if I find like the, I don't, I think the thing is I don't really find sort of theories morally aberrant in themselves. It's more like how people act with respect to those theories, what people do with those theories. Um, but you know, I mean, look, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really, look, if somebody's a Nazi and they're promoting Nazism, I think that's terrible. If, somebody's, you know, a racist, sexist, and they're promoting racism and sexism, I think that's terrible. Of course, these positions are not um, intellectually respectable. Um, so are there, are there philosophies that, you know, I would say it's sort of morally abhorrent to promote them, but that I think are intellectually respectable? Uh, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe, maybe Hobbes, you know, I do find that idea of the absolute leviathan kind of horrifying but I, I like how Hobbes gets there I find his contractarian arguments really interesting and um uh, you know and, and actually I, I don't know I mean am I like I'm not the truth is I'm not even that bothered by uh by the uh the the absolute power of the leviathan um it's not um I, I guess because Hobbes's theory doesn't feel like a threat right it doesn't feel like there's too many people taking that seriously enough for it to be a real threat um and uh, 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 and and yeah, I, I uh, so um, 
<laughs> like it's, it's not not that much of a problem. Maybe something like um, I don't know. Maybe sort of right wing libertarianism. Um, but then, do I find that abhorrent? I mean, there's actually a part of me that's still kind of a bit sympathetic to it. You know, I, I used to I used to be a libertarian. Uh, so yeah, um, I don't think so. I, well, I don't know. I'm I'm really not sure. It's an interesting question. Um, there are certainly views that I find kind of cringy, right? Like, not morally aberrant, but just cringy. I mean, so think about, for instance, I think some people, for example, who believe in God, um, there is a feeling that I have with this where belief in God kind of comes across as um, sort of, it's like the person is not, you know, taking responsibility for their own life. Um, it's like they... they they have to take. They have to project some sort of external authority on, onto the world that's telling them what to do, you know. Um, and it comes across as almost maybe like a little bit cowardly, like uh, you know, like what you like you you need this like entity out there that's like telling you what the plan for your life is, like what <laughs> you know. I mean, um, so this so yeah. I mean, if somebody kind of believes in God and they're taking it that God has. Uh, you know, given them a set of, you know, moral commands and a plan for their life. Um, that's, it's a bit, that's a bit cringy, right? It's not, it's not morally abhorrent, but yeah, it's kind of cringy. Um, I actually feel the same way, I think, about moral realism. And for basically the same reason, you know, uh, you, you know, so more like, see, for me, right, my values are like, they're my values. I, I, like, I, I, make them and I project them onto the world. I don't I don't take it that there's, you know, these objective rules out there which are telling me what to do. That's I mean, first the I mean, not just because it's ridiculous, uh, although I think that it is ridiculous, but it's because like even if there were objective rules, uh I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care about them because, you know, I I make my own decisions and I act on the basis of what matters to me. I don't care about what objectively matters. I care about what matters to me. Um, and so there's something about moral realism that I find a little bit cringy. Uh, for the same reason I find God a little bit cringy. It's like, uh, uh, you know, it's like kind of this abdication of responsibility for one's own values. Um, so, yeah, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> Um, Tala Moazam, why is there anything at all? Why does the universe exist? Why does reality exist at all? Just answer the ultimate why question, both in regards to consciousness and reality. Well, I don't know, maybe it just, uh, maybe it just does. Maybe there's no reason. Why is it, I, I don't know, why does there have to be a reason? What if it's just, it's just this, it's just there. I just don't see what's wrong with that answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, hey, maybe there's maybe there's a deeper answer to it, but um, it seems to me totally acceptable to say that um, the universe just popped into existence for no reason that it just happened. Um, it like it there it was, and there was and there's just nothing like further to be said about it. That seems acceptable to me. Also, it seems acceptable to me to say that the universe has just always existed and it's just. This is the just the there it's just just there uh, and there's no reason <laughs> and there's no explanation. Um, I genuinely don't find that to be like problematic. Uh, I I don't feel the need. For, I don't feel like any pull to give a further answer. I mean, there may be an answer, and maybe there's something intellectually useful in kind of searching for further answers. But I, you know, like I I've never felt that pull. Right, it, it it it's always seemed to me to be absolutely acceptable to just say like, there it is, um, that's it. I I wouldn't even say uh, that like it's a brute fact because I feel like talking about brute facts, you know, you're then distinguishing kind of brute facts from non-brute facts. You're sort of engaging in uh, you, you know constructing a metaphysical theory. Like if you say the universe is a brute fact, that in itself is a kind of explanation. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, and it's a kind of explanation which invokes a metaphysical distinction between different kinds of facts. Um, so I'm not even going that far. I'm just saying it's always struck me it's perfectly acceptable to just say it's there and that's it. <laughs>
Uh, Terry, what are your thoughts on Timothy Williamson's work? I don't really have any thoughts on it, is, is the honest answer. I, um, I'm i not um, like deeply familiar with him and you know, I don't, I don't really, yeah, I, I just don't have anything to say. Um, maybe this is because I'm like, okay, this is the problem, right? Your name's Terry, it's with a T, which means you're right at the end of the, uh, of the list. Maybe my mind is kind of, uh, just fogged up, but like, I can't think about Timothy Williamson at the moment. I don't, I don't actually like Timothy Williamson that much. Um, I don't find his work interesting and, uh, I just, I can't. <laughs> uh, where do you stand on the exceptionalism versus anti-exceptionalism debate in the philosophy of logic? Okay, yeah, I, I don't, um, I'm not actually sure. So I think, I think I would probably be some sort of anti-exceptionalist, but um, okay. Uh, so here's the, the problem with anti-exceptionalism is that I think a lot of, a lot of the way that so the way that a lot of anti-exceptionists argue is they say, well, the methods of logic are continuous with those of science, right? Like, so, so logic uses the same sort of abductive methods that science does. You know, we determine the right logical theory by, um, you know, by inference, the best explanation, by, by, by judging theories in terms of explanatory power, simplicity, unification, etc. Now, um, there's a couple of problems. The, the first problem is that I don't really think that I think that that actually rests on a, a picture of science that I'm not sure I accept. I mean, I'm generally skeptical of inference to the best explanation and abduction. Um, so, you know, and I, I don't think that there really are uh, sort of scientific methods, that there is any sort of unified scientific enterprise. Um, but, but certainly, you know, inference to the best explanation and abduction, I have um, problems with. I don't think we have a very clear conception of what counts as the best explanation or of what these abductive methods supposedly are. The other thing is that scientific theories, I take it, are at least purporting to be kind of true or false. Um, and I don't really see logical theories or formal logical systems uh, as as like even purporting to be true or false. I mean, so in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I really see formal logical systems as like theories. Um, I'm an instrumentalist about uh, logic. I like there are a whole bunch of different formal systems. They are tools that we can use, um, and you know I don't think that it really makes sense to say that any of them is like the right logic or the one true logic. Um, so I, I mean, I I want to say that I'm on the the anti-exceptionalist side, um, but I. I, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure that. Um, so am I? Am I? Does that make me an anti exceptionalist? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, one thing I, I would say is, look, I think that. There's no robust. So how should I put this? Um, sentences, in my view, don't have like a genuine logical form. Um, so if I say, uh, you know, Cain is a philosopher, therefore there exists an X such that X is a philosopher. Um, well, what's the logical form of that sentence? Well, OK, you can you can just take it as two propositions, in which case you have P, therefore Q. Um, or if you, you know, if you do uh, sort of predicate logic, you can find a more sophisticated form in there. It would be something like, you, you know, um, F.A., therefore ex fx right like um so a has property f therefore there exists an x such that x has property f um and and so so there are alternative pictures of so there are alternative views of what the logical form of this sentence is now my view is that there is not actually any fact of the matter what the logical form of a sentence is um there are different there are different ways of specifying the logical form um Either of those is acceptable, and in in both of those cases, uh, well, actually, in, in those cases, you know, whether or not uh, we have a valid or invalid logical form will then depend on the logic we're using. So, with the more articulated form, um, the that's valid in classical logic. It's not valid in free logic, um, and I think that all of this is, you know, I don't see this as like uncovering 
fact. I don't think we're uncovering facts about the logical form. I don't think that we are uncovering facts about, um, you know, what the correct rules of reasoning are. Uh, so I think that, that I'm an anti-exceptionalist because I take an instrumentalist line on logic. Logic's formal systems are tools and they're tools that, uh, you know, we that, that are used you know, in in our scientific investigations and influenced by our scientific investigations. Um, but I'm not sure I would frame anti-exceptionalism as like, OK, uh, you know, we, we discover the, the, the correct logic in the same way that we discover the correct scientific theory. So maybe in that sense, I'm an exceptionalist. I don't know. This this feels like it wasn't a very good response. I am sorry. I I have probably I should have been talking for so long today that I'm probably not making any sense now. Um, what do you think is the correct philosophical methodology, um, either in general or for some specific subfield of the discipline? I don't think there is a correct philosophical methodology. Certain methodologies are more reliable, depend more or less reliable depending on our goals. Um, but you know, I don't know what what are our goals. I mean, philosophers have all sorts of different goals, and um, I think we should probably be more open about that. Actually, um, yeah, uh, correct philosoph. I don't. I'm not really even sure what my philosophical methodology is. I mean, I often like to say that I do conceptual engineering, but or like that's something that I favour. Like I like conceptual engineering, um, but I suppose it's you know the thing is with conceptual engineering is that um, you know there's uh, it's just something that allows you to, I mean, it, to me, it actually feels a little bit more like giving an excuse, right? Because it's, uh, if you're doing conceptual engineering, you don't really have to worry about what the truth is. Um, and it's just entirely up to you what the standards are for judging what counts as, you know, a, uh, uh, a, 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 a good piece of conceptual engineering like you know i mean what like you can have all sorts of goals with respect to engineering concepts um so you know i often say oh yeah philosophy i i like conceptual engineering um but i don't really know how much i engage in conceptual engineering in my own work and um i uh man this is a bad answer Damn, I really, maybe I should stop here and take a break. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, you have been saddled uh, with this. Um, you know, you asked the questions, you probably expected a sensible answer. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I've been talking for hours and uh, um, my, I am, fr how much more have I got to go? Oh my God, quite a few, still quite a few. Should I just plow ahead? I think I'm just going to plow ahead. Screw it. Look, I think I answered your questions in some sort of way. Um, but look, next time, change your username. Terry, it's got a T. What do you expect? You're going to be right at the end. So you're going to get like, I've, I'm, I'm done, man. Like the, I, I, uh, the, I'm running on empty here. Okay. Um, change your name to Adam next time and then you'll get a much better response. Okay, the Glen 8. What is your favourite joke? I'm not going to tell you my favourite joke. I can't do it. I can't do it right now. Not because it's politically incorrect or anything like that. It's just um, it requires physical action. And so I'm, I just can't do that here in this context. Um, so I'm afraid you're going to have to wait uh, to hear my favourite joke. Uh, if I ever tell you, I'm, I may never do it. Um, the Cooper King. What prevents your radical empiricism from collapsing into radical scepticism? I also lean empiricist, but it seems like you endorse some crazy positions like truth relativism. I think endorsements like truth relativism are what, are what initially push people away from being a radical skeptic, but it seems like radical empiricism eventually converges with a lot of what radical skepticism endorses. What delineates your stance from a radical skeptics? Well, the question here is, what exactly is radical skepticism? What is that? Um, so I think there's a couple of ways of thinking about this, right? So um, in the first sense, we might say that a radical skeptic is somebody who says that there is just no justification that, uh, and, and that it is irrational to form beliefs without justification. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the radical skeptic will say that all beliefs are irrational um, because no beliefs are justified and it's irrational to form beliefs without justification. Uh, another way of stating scepticism is the Peronian skeptic who just suspends judgment, total suspension of judgment. Um, so they make no claims. Now, 
I am not a skeptic in either of those senses. Uh, as it happens, I agree that there is no justification, but I will go ahead and form beliefs anyway, and I don't think there's anything irrational about that. I don't see why that's irrational. Um, and uh, I mean, actually, you know, this is in the tradition of, um, you know, uh, the uh, the great empiricist Hume. Uh, Hume held that reason alone is destructive, um, but that we so like if you apply you know reason if you apply the canons of reason then you know that will just completely undermine all beliefs. But then we go ahead and form beliefs anyway on the basis of uh, custom or habit. Um, so uh, I I don't know. I mean I I don't really see myself as a, a radical skeptic uh, as a radical skeptic. I don't think empiricism is committed to radical skepticism. Um, now as for truth relativism. Well, truth relativism, I mean, like, I, I don't think that entails radical skepticism. In fact, truth relativism is incompatible with radical skepticism. Uh, so, like, I look, I believe truth relativism. I am a truth relativist. I believe truth relativism. So truth relativism is a substantive position about truth, um, like just in itself. Right. So to be a to be a relativist about truth is already uh, to, like, endorse a position <laughs> And that would presumably mean you're not a radical skeptic. Um, moreover, I, not only will I claim that truth is relative, I'll make loads of more specific first order claims about what's true and what's false. You know, it's true that there's a computer in front of me. Uh, it's false that Donald Trump won the 2020 election, 2020 US election. So I'm happy to say that there are truths and I know what they are, right? It's true that I have hands. Um, a skeptic would suspend judgment about truth relativism and she would suspend judgment about all of the other things I claim to think are true. Or she would say that it is irrational to endorse truth relativism. It is irrational to uh, believe all of the things I claim to believe. Um, I, I don't, uh, that's, yeah, obviously that's not my stance, right? Like I have a bunch of beliefs. I don't think I'm being irrational in holding those beliefs. Um, I like, yeah, I mean, so I don't I think that that is what distinguishes me from a radical skeptic. Um, now, as for the point that, um, well, you know, empiricism. So you say I, you know, lean empiricism, but it seems to endorse some crazy positions like truth relativism. Uh, I don't know, man, I don't think truth relativism is crazy. Uh, <laughs> that's all I can say. I do think that a lot of the standard criticisms of truth relativism are just straw mans. Um, and I think it's fairly, it's fairly easy, I think, to not necessarily argue in favour of, to like give a convincing argument for the theory, but I think it's fairly easy to show that the theory is not refuted by the standard objections. Um, What's your end goal in philosophy? Is it just a pastime for you, like playing video games, where the goal is to have fun for, stay, for sustained periods of time? Or do you think you're building towards something, maybe understanding the world or developing your own theory? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much just having fun. I That's it. I just enjoy it. Uh, I don't see why there has to be more to it than that. Um, although, as it happens, I have, you know, I have uh, also... I mean, look, part of doing philosophy is you know, learning about alternative theories, learning the arguments for them. Um, I don't know whether that gives you understanding of the world, but uh, like, it's not, you know, I mean, just doing philosophy um, <laughs> is going to allow you to like develop theories, right? That's just part of what doing philosophy is. What was the question that you initially said stumped you in your PhD defence? I don't remember. I'm sorry, I... I genuinely can't remember. I, I, I remember very, very little of that uh, defence. <clears throat> but yeah, that um, that first question, I know how it felt. <laughs> I remember the feeling, um, but I do not remember any of the uh, theoretical content of the discussion. Um, the Piano Man, have you heard of Josh Rasmussen? If so, what are your thoughts on him as a philosopher? Uh, I I heard about him when I uploaded that video on uh, Necessary Being. Uh, uh, somebody pointed out that he was the one who actually made that little quiz. Um, so I don't really have any thoughts on him. I, I don't I don't know enough about him to have formed any significant thoughts. 
Um, Tudor Marginian, have you considered learning programming? It would be easier to get a job compared to philosophy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just not really interested in it. So, I mean, there's loads of things I'm not interested in that would allow me to, uh, you know, get a career, uh, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, maybe I should. You know what? Maybe this is something I should do. I don't know how easy it would be uh, and like what the chances are of kind of breaking into the field. I suppose I'd have to look into that. Um, but, um, well, you know, um, I'll, I'll bear it in mind. I mean, thanks for the suggestion. Um, turn your base up. What do you have to say about the ontology of knowledge? For example, is our human brain capable of knowing anything and everything? Could a mouse know concepts as advanced as those known to humans? And if not, does that possibly preclude us from knowing all there is to know? Uh, uh, let's say the ultimate truth is that we're all living in some kind of Truman-esque universe. But we are limited in our capacity of knowing, so could never grasp this concept. Does this render the knowledge we have insufficient, outright wrong, or something else? Um, I don't really know what what the ontology of knowledge is. Um, but, the, I mean, is, I, is the human brain capable of knowing anything and everything? Um... I have no reason whatsoever to believe that. Um, it also seems pretty clear to me that uh, there are things that human beings know that mice cannot know. Um, uh, you know, mice just can't form the relevant concepts uh, to know certain things that humans know. Um, it seems entirely plausible that there are things that currently outstrip our conceptual capacities. In fact, historically, um, you know, so people have made claims historically about what is, you know, what is inconceivable. Um, and, you know, they made claims about what must necessarily be true just as a matter of like conceptual limits. Um, but then it's turned out that they've been wrong and that, you know, conceptual development has uh, shown that, you know, the things they offered as necessary truths uh, are not even true, let alone necessarily true. So, you know, it was once thought that Euclidean geometry um, was, you know, just like known a priori, uh, known necessarily to be true a priori. It's just kind of built into the nature of our concepts of space. Um, but then, you know, in the uh, 1800s, a bunch of mathematicians developed non-Euclidean geometries. And not only did they develop these geometries, but they, end up getting, they ended up getting empirical evidence that the structure of the universe might be non-Euclidean. Like, so it's not just that uh, you know, these aren't just like little abstract things we can play with, but it's like they're actually useful for modeling uh, the structure of the world. Um, so, I, yeah, and I think there have been many cases where, you know, philosophers have, have cited certain, you know, propositions as, um, you know, necessary truths, like a priori truths or uh, conceptual truths. And... Um, and then, and then we end up uh, like, well, concepts end up developing in other directions. Um, so, I mean, I take it that, uh, and, and then of course, you know, like, well, yeah, I mean, maybe the, um, the human mind just has certain cognitive limits that it, it isn't gonna uh, overcome, no matter how much conceptual development we, we have. I, I don't see any reason to rule that out. <clears throat> uninspired what fictional work lays in the most interesting philosophical implications um i think probably the best i've seen for philosophy is is probably star trek the next generation uh i think um it i i don't know of any other i don't know about other star trek uh series but the next generation specifically um is pretty philosophically sophisticated i mean not like, you know, I mean, it's not like sitting down with David Lewis, with a David Lewis book, you know, but it's pretty sophisticated as far as, um, as far as fictional works go. So, uh, yeah, but I, I, in general, I, I don't really like, um, fiction that tries to be philosophical. That's not really something I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, I think it's usually... You know, like when you get films, for instance, that or TV shows that like try to build in philosophy, it's usually just bad philosophy. And uh, often enough, it ends up being uh, bad fiction as well. Um, but Star Trek The Next Generation does it well. Um, 
<laughs> Yuri Katz, do you have a do you personally have a purpose in life? If not, are you looking for one or do you think you'll be fine without one? I do not have. I, I don't think of my life as having any particular purpose, no, and I am perfectly happy with that. Um I don't yeah, I mean but like what why would I why would I need a purpose? I there are, I have purposes for specific things I do. Uh you know, there's a purpose in recording this video. Um but a purpose for my life overall. I think if I did conceive of my life as having a purpose, I might find that a little bit limiting. I mean, one of the things that I like being able to do is just pursue different projects. You know, I, I don't really want to be committed to a particular project just in virtue of being alive. Be like the so what? Like the only way out of pursuing that project is to kill myself. What the hell? Uh, like no, I just, like I I just want to be able to flip from one thing to another as. Um, as my uh, as my inclinations take me, and um, so I have no no need for there to be a purpose to my life. Um, what is your opinion on socialism? What is your opinion on capitalism? Uh, I I suppose I'd probably lean in favour of some sort of socialism. Maybe I don't I, I don't know. I'm not an economist. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think that I would need to know a lot more about economics to feel uh, comfortable answering this question, to be honest. Uh, OK, um, video essay guy asks, uh, I want to ask you some questions regarding corporal punishment and trauma. First, do you think corporal punishment causes trauma and to what extent if it does so? Dude, what? I mean, look, I know that this isn't ask me anything, but like, why? Why are you asking me this question? What? What? Why would I know anything about this? Uh, I don't know. Obviously. Obviously, this is not something I have any clue about. Um, uh, if you think corporal punishment does cause trauma, does it cause more trauma if the society where the recipient of the corporal punishment lives recognizes corporal punishment as a traumatic experience. Basically, if something is widely considered to be traumatic, does it become more traumatic in that society? Um, uh, I mean, okay, look, yeah, you know, trauma, tra trauma, trauma is a very broad notion. Um, I, I, it probably does cause some sort of trauma. Uh, and in general, I oppose corporal punishment. Um, as for this idea of uh, whether something becomes more traumatic if it is believed to be traumatic, you might want to look into um, Ian Hacking's work on on looping kinds. Um, but I think that so you know Ian Hacking makes this point, which I think is true, that um, one of the interesting things about classifications of human beings is that human beings are responsive to the way that they are classified. So. Um, you know, if we start uh, investigating human society and then we start looking at corporal punishment, we will begin classifying people. We will begin classifying people who, as though as people into uh, those who received corporal punishment, those who didn't, will make distinctions into different types of corporal punishment. Um, you know, one society might say that all corporal punishment is abusive. Another society might say that, you know, some types of corporal punishment are abusive, some types are not. Um, and the key thing is that the classifications into which we sort people, um, once people know that they uh, are classified in a particular way, this will then change them. It will change how they behave. They will respond to it in some way. Um, so if I know that I have received corporal punishment and corporal punishment is considered to be abusive in my society, that will like I, that will affect me. That Just being classified in that way will affect me. It will affect uh, my self-conception, and I may respond to it in various different ways. I may, uh, I may sort of accept the classification, and um, you know, I may then try to. I may then think, okay, well, maybe I am a victim of abuse. I conceive of myself as a victim of abuse. I uh, am then going to be, perhaps, relating the previous experiences with corporal punishment to problems that you know. Maybe if I have depression or anxiety, maybe I will see a link between the corporal punishment and the mental issues that I have. Um, you know, so I, that that might I might respond in that way. You know, I might respond by accepting the classification and then um, seeing connections to my life, and you know, that's going to affect uh, the way that I behave. Um, 
or I might resist the classification. Um, I might say, I, I, I might, I, I might say no, you know, like, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not a victim. Um, you know, so, so the, the key thing is, is that, um, you know, Ian Hacking says that human kinds, human classifications are looping kinds because you make a classification, you sort people into these boxes, you put people into particular boxes and then people respond to that and then that changes their properties. So when you when you say that, you know, people who are uh, who have received corporal punishment have these characteristics, right? So we say there are people who've received corporal punishment and the people who've received corporal punishment tend to have certain characteristics. Well, the thing is, is that just knowing that you have been classified in that way will then change your characteristics. Um, and so that's going to change the classification. And then, of course, because the classification has been changed, well, that itself is then going to change the people, again, who are so classified. So, you know, there's this, this sort of feedback effect that, that people are classified, that then changes their behavior, that changes the classification, which then again changes their behavior and so on. Um, I'm talking very abstractly here because I know absolutely nothing about um, corporal punishment and trauma. Um, I know nothing about it. So uh, I can say, I mean, one thing I can say, of course, is that the um, the relation is not straightforward. So, I mean, you say that, you, you do say, well, um, uh, if you think corporal punishment does cause trauma, does it cause more trauma if the society where the recipient of corporal punishment lives recognizes corporal punishment as a traumatic experience? Well, maybe, but it might go in the opposite direction, right? So uh, um, it might be that if something is widely considered traumatic, um, you, like, because you are aware of that, um, again, you know, it depends, like somebody might be aware that a particular action is considered traumatic, and then that might make them um, actually respond to it in a way that it ends up being uh, positive in the long run. I mean, you, you know, there's all sorts of ways that human beings respond to things. And so it's not as simple as, um, it, you know, it's not going to be like this simple situation where we say that a particular thing is traumatic, and then people feel traumatized, um, because people will resist their classifications. Uh, at least some people will. Uh, Vaclav Miller, in your opinion, can political authority be justified on liberalism? Liberalism is such a broad tradition of thought um, that I, I mean, you know, you're sort of asking, okay, um, we have a whole family of different theories. Uh, are some of these theories such that from the point of view of those theories, political authority will be justified. Well, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, like, if you accept certain, you know, if you accept certain theoretical principles, then, you know, you're going to get a justification for political authority. Um, so, I, I mean, I would assume that there are probably, yeah, probably some forms of liberalism on which political authority will be justified. I'm not, uh, you know, I... I I don't really see that as a particularly interesting conclusion in itself because liberalism is such a broad church of ideas. And um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, am I even a liberal? I'm not really sure. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you want a liberal justification for political authority, there are probably going to be some liberal theories that will give you that. Um, Villa Kana. Do you think those atheists who are compatibilists about free will are inconsistent if they complain about the predestination of God? They blame God for not believing and they don't take moral responsibility for their lack of belief. Um, you know, no, I don't think that's necessarily inconsistent because uh, a compatibilist does not, in, you know, does not in principle have to hold that just any cause of one's behaviour is compatible with free will. So the thing... So the situation, I suppose, with God is um, it, it may be the case that if there is some other agent who has produced your behavior, uh, you know, like if some other agent has set things up in such a way that you will behave in a particular way, um, then a compatibilist could take that as, uh, you know, undermining responsibility. Um, so the compatibilist might say that actually in that case, it's going to be the Pre, you know, the agent who has set things up in a particular way is the one who is uh, responsible for that. Um, I mean, it's, it, you know, look, it, it depends on the kind of compatibilism, right? Um, 
So if somebody is a compatibilist who says that all you need for free will is, um, you know, the ability to form, the ability to reflect on your actions and to form second order desires and to, you know, act on second order desires and so on. If you say something like that, then uh, I don't think it would make any sense to complain about predestination of God. Um, you know, people could still have free will, even if there's a God. Uh, but again, it just depends on how the individual elaborates on, you know, compatibilism, because, um, yeah, I mean, like, if I, if I, uh, if I sort of put a, a chip in your brain, which makes you act in a particular way, um, so that, like, I'm ultimately the one responsible, so, so, yeah, then a compatibilist might say, well, it's me who's responsible for the way that you're acting and not you, um, so there are cert there are certain types of causal chains that a compatibilist will say are compatible with free will, and other types of causal chains that aren't. Um, I mean, that's that's actually already the case because the compatibilists recognise that there are plenty of things people do that are not done out of free will. Um, you know, like uh, uh, I don't know, maybe if somebody gets drugged um, at a party. Uh, and then they perform certain actions, you know, like they're, they're drugged. And so, you know, their reasoning capacities have been um, and they're drugged without their knowledge or consent. Um, so, you know, they're drugged without their knowledge or consent. And then that like radically alters their personality. We might a compatibilist, I think, could reasonably say that, yeah, that's they're no longer acting out of free will in that case. Um, so certain, yeah, like the, the certain um, causal influences will be compatible with free will, but not all. <laughs> you know, you don't have to say that all are. Um, will asks, can I rim you? Um, I mean, I don't really have a problem with that. It's not like it would bother me. Um, I have to say, it's not something I'm really interested in. I've, I've never really been interested in um, anybody doing anything to my anus. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't really get much out of that. Um, uh, I, I mean, I don't really, it, it doesn't produce much pleasure for me. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm very much uh, in favour of doing things to women's anuses. Um, so, you know, I, I will happily shove my tongue up a woman's butthole. But uh, Will? Will? I mean, I don't know, is that short for Wilma? Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm, uh, I'm actually no longer, uh, no longer single anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think I think Will, uh, I might not be so keen on doing things with you. Um, I'm sorry to say, though I do appreciate the interest. Um, William Franklin, uh, what would you recommend as good sites or platforms to discuss and or learn about philosophy? I actually don't know because I never used sites or platforms to learn about philosophy. Uh, I mean, I do know that um, I think I think that Reddit's Ask Philosophy sub is pretty good uh even though they banned me um i think they are they are actually pretty good at um uh and you know just like straight up just giving people straightforward answers to philosophical questions i mean so if there is uh a a, a something you're struggling with some some philosophical concept you don't understand some argument you don't understand reddit's ask philosophy sub is is pretty good um uh, I don't know whether it's so good for, like, discussions. Um, if you want discussions, then um, I'm told that there are some Discord uh, servers that are, that are good. Maybe my Discord server is good. I mean, I have a Discord server, you know. I've put the link up on various videos. Um, but, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I, I don't know. When I was learning philosophy, I, basically, I, you know, I just read books and stuff. So uh, I'm not really familiar with uh, what the what sort of sites and platforms there are out there. Woodle, what are the IRL implications for moral realism, public policy, moral institutions, human rights, etc.? Uh, none whatsoever, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I just think that, um, look, if we're talking about public policy, if we're talking about institutions, if we're talking about human rights, then we're engaging in a first order normative debate and I think that you can do that without a commitment to any particular form of metaethics. And, you know, whether you're a realist or an anti-realist, you can engage in moral argument. Um, you can hold 
very strong moral views. You can promote particular moral views. You can be in favor of, you know, public institutions being organized in particular ways. Um, the the meta ethics, like, okay, if you're getting into meta ethics, um, then you're doing philosophy. And I think that that is at its heart, not really a practical activity. Um, you know, if you're asking, like, whether or not there are moral facts, stance independent moral facts, <laughs> then, um, yeah, I don't think that's something that really has any influence on, um, you know, these kind of first order debates. So, I mean, there, there are some ways that it, it can. I mean, like I do, so there are certain meta-ethical positions which m might well uh, entail particular first order normative views. But I think broadly speaking, um, yeah, somebody can do the, uh, the first order moral debates without worrying at all about the meta-ethics. And a lot, a lot of people do. Um, <clears throat> World Salva Tony. What do you prefer, naturalized metaphysics or scholastic metaphysics? I suppose um, naturalized metaphysics in virtue of the fact that I um, have never really engaged with scholastic metaphysics. Uh, I mean, of course, I, I know a little bit about it, but, you know, I mean, like the scholastics is, that's not a, 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 an area of philosophy that I have much education in. Um, you know, naturalized metaphysics is an interesting approach. I think it's fundamentally misconceived. Um, I think that there's something about uh, the sort of scholastic approaches that are a bit more sort of ballsy, you know, and I feel like if you're going to do metaphysics, then I guess you might as well be ballsy because I don't think, so I don't think naturalized metaphysics um, is really that much better off. If you're doing that, nat so naturalized metaphysics, I think, um, rests on two problematic assumptions. The first assumption is it's, it's almost certainly going to be committed to some sort of scientific realism. Um, maybe not, you know, full-on robust scientific realism, maybe like structural realism, but you're going to have to be some sort of realist um, in order to, uh, like, get metaphysics out of science, right? Um, so if you're going to be, like, using uh, uh, science to guide your metaphysical inquiry, if you think that, um, it, yeah, if you think that, <laughs> that you can reveal that science reveals the uh, structure or nature of the world behind the phenomena, then you're going to be committed to scientific realism. Well, I'm not a scientific realist. So, you know, I mean, it already falls down on on that hurdle. Um, and then uh, but then even if I was a scientific realist, there's a there's there's a question here of like, well, what is it that philosophy can can contribute? I mean, like, so when we're doing naturalized metaphysics, I think the assumption has to be that, you know, so science can penetrate uh, into the world a certain a certain distance. You know, science reveals um, the facts about the world, the facts about various domains, but uh, it has limits. And uh, if we do metaphysics, then we can push past some of these limits, right? Like there is there is space for distinctively metaphysical inquiry to, um, you know, reveal more of the, the structure or nature of the world than is revealed in the sciences. And I mean, again, that's just another, uh, that's, uh, I, I think uh, uh, that's just another step that I'm, I'm skeptical of. I, I don't know, I don't see why I should accept that. The reasons that are given for accepting scientific realism, like if I was to, be, to accept scientific realism, then, you know, I guess it would be on the basis of the arguments for realism. And those arguments very often will appeal to things like, um, you know, well, uh, realism is the best explanation for the remarkable success of science. So maybe we should be realists because that best explains um, the uh, remarkable uh, number of novel predictions um, of our best theories. Um, well, OK, that gets you scientific realism, but then metaphysics does not you know can't can't boast any sort of uh, successful novel predictions so the type of success that justifies being a realist about the sciences isn't going to extend to any kind of metaphysics um and yeah i mean i think at the end of the day i mean if you if you are going in for metaphysics if you're doing that kind of thing if you think that um distinctively metaphysical methods really do have the capacity to 
uh, reveal the world. I mean, why why let yourself be constrained by the sciences? Why not just go all out uh, like the scholastics did or or do? Um, okay. Um, was he Duran Jahamita? Okay, you've asked like 14 questions here, and I don't really know what... I mean, these are very strange questions, dude. So, uh, question one is, would you take care properly of an archive library in a castle? No, I would not. That's of no interest to me. How would you make better resumes for your videos to be properly organised and easier to be understood by kids, schoolers? Well, um, I, I wouldn't do that. I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> You know, I've put a certain amount of effort in and um, I mean, if other people want to try to make them more accessible, then that's great. Yeah, have my support. But um, I, I mean, I've already tried to like organize my videos into playlists and stuff. And um, so, uh, yeah, like I have a certain degree of organization already on the channel. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, there comes a point where it's like I'm doing this because I find it fun and having to spend a lot of time organizing things is not fun. Um, so I, I do what I find fun and that's about it. Um, uh, how much time would you need to put a section of 200 square meters of books and various knowledge? I, I don't know what this is, dude. I don't know what this is. Uh, <laughs> would you like to work with crows, cats, dogs, owls? No, I don't want to work with any animals. I, um, I don't particularly like animals. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I mean I, I mean, I find them interesting, but I don't want to live with them. I don't want to work with them. I don't want to have any kind of responsibility for them. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on with these questions. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I might just move on. I'm, I'm sorry, but like th these, oh, I mean, okay. Um, Screw it. Uh, I'll just continue. I'll, I'll just answer them. So how do you work with other assistants? I don't have assistants. How much time would you dedicate to give proper resumes to visitors or schoolers? I don't know what that means. Um, would you improve physically if exercises and an instructor are provided? I guess if I did exercises, I would improve physically, but I am already pretty damn healthy. I'm like, I actually do uh, a, a, a you know, not a lot of exercise, but I do enough exercise that I'm pretty healthy. Um, although an instructor would not be good. It would not be a good idea for me. I don't respond well to uh, people trying to offer me exercise encouragement or to offer me exercise instruction. Um, I, As soon as somebody starts doing that kind of thing, I stop. I, it really just gets under my skin now. I don't, it really bothers me. So I don't want an instructor. I just like to do it on my own and let my brain shut down. Um, are you Christian? No, I don't think Christianity has got anything going for it whatsoever. Uh, are you devoted to humbleness and teaching preservings? Absolutely not. Um, I, um, I'm not particularly humble. I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm arrogant, but I'm, no, I'm not overly humble. I mean, I, you know, there's things I'm I'm good at, and I'm happy to be quite open about the things I'm good at, and I, I think I'm great in certain ways. As for preserving teachings, uh, I'm happy to just, you know, like, burn down all the teachers. I don't care. Like, yeah, burn them down. Let's start again. Screw it. Um, I don't really have any desire to preserve things. Um would you abandon books if it is needed for your life to be conserved in order to teach new generations? Yes, happy to abandon books to conserve my life. Would you be eager to hunt a boar in case it attacks a library? I'm not going to hunt a boar. I don't care about libraries. I'm not interested in hunting and uh, I don't care about libraries being attacked by boars. Um, would you call for help when you sent something nasty or would you be going alone to search? I'm not, I'm not, I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> Would you, would you need time to recharge your social batteries? Uh, I do need time to do that. I'm very introverted and uh, I get quite exhausted uh, being around other people. What conditions would you make in order to make the library cosy? I, I wouldn't make it cosy. If I was in charge of a library, I would ensure that it was... Uh, I, I would um, have, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, imposing cold, barren, brutalist architecture. Brutalism, I'd have, you know, raw concrete everywhere. Um, that's the kind of thing I like. Uh, Young Dolph De Nice. Do you got any movie recommendations that somehow reflect your way of thinking? 
Um, not really, no. Uh, no, I don't. I don't watch a lot of movies these days, and movies that reflect my way of thinking... Uh, I mean, I can't think of any off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to have to say... Um, so yeah, I mean, what movies out there? Are there any are there any movies that like reflect reflect my way of thinking? You mean like the views I hold or my attitudes? Um, I can't think of any. I can't think of any. This is the last question, so I suppose I can just sort of you know waste time with this one. So I can just kind of sit here and and think. I can, um, but yeah. Um, I'm not coming up with anything. Um, I, I, as I say, I don't really watch a lot of movies these days anyway. Um, and uh, I, uh, it tends to be the case that I think movies which have like philosophical elements, they tend to be really shit. Um, so they tend to be really bad at philosophy and they are also usually quite bad at being movies. You know, I tend to prefer my philosophy to be separate from my art. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm not thinking of anything. Okay, that's the end of that. Thanks for all those questions, guys.